السلام علیکم السلام علیکم اوگم اوگم پاہن وعلیکم السلام پروف اوکی سوگم جدہ تنگ لے بلو نتنگ لگی Semua dah ada ke? Okay, tahap kedua, let's start. One more minute. Okay, it's two o'clock now. Uh, kalau boleh, kita nak tengok semua muka-muka supaya I am not talking to a, a dead piece of computer. Okay. All right. Silakan. What are we doing today? Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Prof. Uh, so my name is Fatin Hanani. So I'll be the first presenter for hematology seminar together with my friends, uh, Nabila, Izen Fatiha, Muhammad Afiq, and also Muhammad Al-Hakim for today's seminar. So okay. I'll be sharing the screen uh, for my topic, which is uh, nutritional anemia. Okay, why don't you tell what the other people are talking about as well. Uh, in this nutritional anemia, I've included the uh, now, what, briefly. What, what, what are the speakers? What are they going to talk about? Uh, basically, they will talk about uh, another uh, example and type of anemia, such as a plastic anemia, uh, a plastic anemia, the, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, uh, thalass uh, thalassemia and also ITP. Uh, so what's the common theme? Uh, the sign as, and as, symptom of anemic. As, as the first speaker, you must be able to give an overview. Okay, we're going to talk on thalassemia, on, on anemia. As you know, there are many classification of anemia and we're going to give example of one of each. For example, Hemolytic anemia, we're going to talk on autoimmune hemolytic anemia, we're going to talk on G6PD, and uh, so and so, we're going to talk on thalassemia. And oh, then nice. on uh, bone marrow failure as a cause of anemia, we're going to talk on the plastic anemia. And uh, as uh, nutritional anemia, okay, and then my friend is going to talk on iron deficiency and folic acid deficiency, for example. So this will tell everybody. Yeah, Billy, Billy, when you int introduce and all that, a seminar, this is what you have to say. You have to introduce what is the big picture, what's the overall view, what this seminar is all about. Yeah? Uh, all right, Prof. Okay. Uh, okay, basically, uh, 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 so now you can uh, Basically, in my presentation, I also will include the briefly the general definition of anemia and also okay. the classification of the anemia itself. Okay, good. Uh, and also, I will be proceeding with the nutritional anemia, which is I'll be presenting about the iron deficiency anemia and also megaloblastic anemia. Actually, uh, actually usually when you talk, um, because this is but very specific. Usually when you talk about the subject, you want to talk about the general thing. So good, you want to define anemia. You want to classify the type of anemia. And then you want to talk about the features, general features of anemia, any anemia at all. Yeah? And yes. what features can differentiate between all that? And then how do you investigate a patient with anemia in general? Yeah. And then yes. how do you manage anemia in general? And then after that, you go into specific things. Yeah. So yes. if you, five of you can talk about specific things and all that, then that's not good. Yeah? You cannot see the forest because of the trees. You nampak detail, you nampak pokok aja. You cannot see it, that you are in the jungle. You nampak pokok, pokok aja. So you must see the forest first. When you see the forest, then you identify, oh, there is this tree, this tree, this tree. So any topics at all, it is good for you to know everything in general first. 
definition, uh, sign and symptom, investigation, management. Okay. All right. Yes, carry on. But this is how I would uh, like you all to do it. For example, if you have any more uh, seminars with me. Yeah? Okay. On any subject at all. For example, uh, heart failure. You talk about what is the definition of heart failure. What are the etiological causes of heart failure? For example, pump failure or output failure or whatever it is. And then what are the presentation? What we want to ask in the industry? How do you investigate heart failure? And then uh, how you manage heart failure in general? And then you go to specific things. For example, talk about PSG as a cause of heart failure. And then we discuss that. Then it'd be very easy for your friends to understand when you go to specific things. If you have covered the general principle. Okay. 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 How many slides have we got? Uh, uh, 20, 21. Okay, good. Because I think uh, we should try and finish this by two hours. So 20 slides, five speakers, lima kali dua seratus. So one slide per minute, maybe. So 20 minutes each. And five speakers, that will be about two hours. Huh? All right. All right. Uh, so I'll proceed with the definition of anemia. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, based uh, definition based on Robin's basic pathology, uh, anemia can be defined as reduction in oxygen transporting capacity of blood, which usually stems from decrease in the red cell mass. This is because of the reduction of total circulating RBC mass to below normal level. Uh, but anemia also can be defined as uh, the value of hemoglobin level below normal range. Okay. And below normal range for age and gender. Yes. Uh, okay. Because yes. the normal range depends on age and gender and sex, isn't it? And what's the other definition? One is hemoglobin level, and the other one is reduction in oxygen transporting. Capacity. Yeah, that is the that is the basic one, which is very difficult for you to say, isn't it? How are you yes. going to measure that? So basically, you measure hemoglobin, and the other one is hematocrit. Yeah. Yeah. She said yes. the hemoglobin and hematocrit. Yes. So based on uh, this, anemia can be reflected uh, based on the concentration of hemoglobin and also hematocrit level. So based on the uh, pictures on the left side, uh, it is given the hematological parameters, basically the hemoglobin level based on the age, starting from the cord blood up until to 7 to 12 years. So basically, the, uh, the level of the hemoglobin uh, differ from the age and also declining towards the 7 to 12 years. Uh, so next, uh, it will be classification of anemia. Basically, anemia can be classified based on the etiology or causes and also the red blood cells morphology. So based on these causes, uh, anemia can be classified based on uh, three uh, aspects, which is due to impact red cell production or increased red cell destruction or also known as hemolysis and also blood loss. Uh, from this, uh, iron deficiency and also folic acid deficiency is uh, categorized based on uh, falls on the ineffective erythropoiesis, which I will be explaining uh, briefly after this. Uh, okay. Yeah, what else? What is? Uh, now, the other thing is uh, under impact uh, production, okay? The other one is bone, yeah, bone marrow failure, and then ineffective erythropoiesis, and the other one is bone marrow infiltration. Yeah, if bone marrow is infiltrated, for example, with uh, 
any, uh, with uh, leukemia, then you can get anemia as well. Yeah, infiltrated by neuroblastoma cells, you can get anemia as well. The patient has got myelofibrosis, okay? Just fibrosis and bone marrow, then that's considered as infiltration as well. Osteopetrosis, okay? So impaired production is because of the failure, either because of a decrease in uh, substrate or the factory just failed, or there is infiltration. Yeah? Understand? Just like you imagine your factory, you know, a crater, for example, if there is uh, not enough iron, not enough rubber, and that you cannot make tires, you cannot make the body. So that is ineffective if what is not enough raw material. And the other one, the other one is just the bone marrow failure. The factory just failed. Yeah, but up and there, but the uh, cater, for example, then that is bone marrow aplasia, red cell aplasia, aplastic anemia. And then the other one is infiltration. Yeah, for example, the factory is infiltrated by foreign workers who do not know anything, cannot communicate. Yeah, and that can cause decreased production as well. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, red cell destruction, you can picture. Red blood cells, there is enzyme inside, there's hemoglobin inside, then there's a cell wall, and then there are factors outside the red blood cells. So the causes are red cell membrane problem, the wall, and then what's inside, the enzymes, and then what's inside, hemoglobin. So any problem with hemoglobin, any problem with enzymes. And then what is outside the cell, antibodies and all that, so there's immune problem. Yeah? It's not just immune problem. Can be mechanical problem as well. For example, patient with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, huh? yeah, because of the mechanical destruction of uh, red blood cell, not due to immune destruction. All right, chronic uh, intestinal blood loss. The anemia is not due to decrease in hemoglobin because of the blood is losing and all that, but because chronic blood loss can cause iron deficiency. Yeah? When you uh, lose one drop of blood every day, two drops of blood every day cause iron deficiency, and that will come under iron deficiency anemia causing chronic blood loss. Bleeding disorders, uh, again, it, you do not bleed that much and all that, so there is little, little bleed from the gum, from the nose that can cause iron deficiency anemia as well. Yeah? is only if you bleed a lot. For example, you have uh, esophageal varices and then you vomit blood every day, a lot of blood every day, then you can say that it is due to acute blood loss. Okay. <clears throat> so next, uh, anemia can also be classified according to the morphology. So the specific characteristic of the red blood cells, such as the size, the color, uh, which shows the hemoglobinization and also the shape of the red blood cells. So uh, for iron deficiency anemia, it falls under the hypochromic microcytic anemia and megaloblastic anemia, anemia falls under microcytic anemia. So you should try and uh, combine the two classification together. For example, nomochromic uh, anemia. This is usually due to blood loss. Yeah, due to bone marrow infiltration, due to decreased production. Yeah, for example, red cell aplasia and all that. Yeah, so you should try and uh, combine. Yeah, so hypochromic due to ineffective erythropoiesis due to iron deficiency can be due to hemolysis as well, like uh, thalassemia. Yeah, but some hemolytic anemia, for example, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it shows no more coming, no more so you should try and combine them together, yeah? So that there won't be a confusion. All right. So these RBC indices are judged subjectively by visual inspection on peripheral smear and also based on the lab, uh, lab findings such as mean cell volume, mean cell, mean cell hemoglobin and also red cell distribution width. So uh, go on with the iron deficiency anemia. 
iron deficiency anemia can be uh, due to the impaired red blood cell production, which is the ineffective erythropoiesis, which means that the production of the red blood cell occur at the normal or increasing rate, but the differentiation or survival of the red blood cell is defective and it will cause the iron depletion. For uh, it, the etiology, the main causes of the iron deficiency anemia is caused by inadequate iron intake or increased iron demand uh, during the growth development and also in prematurity. So this causes is common in infant because the additional iron is required for increase in the blood volume accompanying with the growth and to build up the child's iron store. Next, the mark the malabsorption and also the blood loss can be due to the gastrointestinal problem. Uh, uh, for the epidemiology, the most the iron deficiency is the most frequent cause of the anemia in the world, and based on the age, nine percent of toddlers can come with iron deficiency, nine to eleven percent in adolescent girl less than 1% in teenage boys, and also breastfed infant is uh, less prone to iron deficiency anemia than the bottle fat infants. This is because although the breastfed uh, milk is contain low iron content, but the absorption of the iron is uh, about 50%. Uh, so for, yeah. uh, What's the difference between adolescent and teenage? Uh, uh, the age, I think. Uh, is there any difference? There's no difference, isn't it? Teenage, adolescent, same thing. So it's better yeah. for you to use the same term instead of adolescent girl and then teenage boys. Yeah, okay. You can say that adolescent girls and less than 1% in adolescent boys. Or you use teenage girls. 91% and less than 1% of teenage boys. Okay? Ah, oh, all right. Why is the difference? Why is it more common in girls, teenage girls? Uh, due to the uh, uh, menstruation? Yeah, so it's due to monthly blood loss, eh? menstruation, and that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the IE requirement during childhood predominantly for the term newborn is 250 milligram. And the iron intake can be obtained from the breast milk or instant formula, or also cow's milk and also the mixed diet, such as the iron fortified cereals. So for the pathophysiology of iron deficiency adibia, oh. uh, iron is essential in production of the blood and also synthesis of the hemoglobin. So uh, iron de deficiency can develop insidiously from the start, which in, in initial stage, the iron store are reduced without reducing the serum iron and only can be assessed with the serum ferritin measurement, which is the storage form of the iron. So this iron store can be depleted without causing anemia. But once the iron store are depleted, uh, the, the, there are still adequate of iron for uh, red blood cell turnover for the hemoglobin synthesis. But during the second stage, if there is a uh, falls in the hemoglobin levels uh, over the above the lower limit, so it will cause the iron deficiency. So this is considered as iron deficiency anemia because of the hemoglobin level falls less than the normal value. And this inadequacy make it impact on the hemoglobin, myoglobin, and also other iron compound in the body. Uh, so next is the clinical manifestation of iron deficiency. Mostly it is asymptomatic until the hemoglobin level drop uh, less than six to seven gram per deciliter. Uh, so, this man so this is consider considered as severe anemia, isn't it? Yes. How, how, how do you grade anemia? Three. How do you grade it? Grade it uh, based on the uh, the level of the hemoglobin. Okay. Yeah. So, what are the grades? 
six to seven can considered as uh, five to seven can considered as severe, and then ten to eleven uh, considered as uh, moderate. So five to seven is severe, ten to eleven is moderate. What about in between seven to ten? So this is what I meant. You have to go to general principle first. Yeah, you talk about specific thing. Uh, talk about and uh, I didn't see any more in detail when you don't even know what is the classification in terms of the grade of anemia. It's mild, moderate, and severe. Severe, most books say less than eight. Moderate is between eight to nine point five, and mild is between nine point five to eleven. So anemia is defined as hemoglobin less than 11. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this uh, clinical manifestation is a non-specific manifestation, which includes the uh, sign and symptom of anemia, which is weakness, fatigue, pallor, uh, uh, short of breath, shortness of breath, but it can also, uh, in young infants, it can include uh, where the patient can fit more slowly than usual or develop uh, characteristic of neurobehavioral complications such as PICA. PICA is compulsive eating disorder, which uh, the patient consume non-food items such as soil, chalk, gravel, foam rubber. And patient also can develop CNS, uh, central nervous system abnormalities such as apathy, irritability, and poor concentration in severe anemia. Uh, and iron deficiency can also associated with later cognitive deficit and poor school performance that can show uh, that that will impact the behavioral and inter intellectual function of the patient. Where do you get these lovely pictures from? Uh, from uh, I get it from a website, but uh, it's a, like kind of journey, I think. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, next is the diagnostic clues or investigation that can perform to uh, to indicate uh, iron deficiency anemia. First, we can can do a full blood count. Uh, FBC, which shows the abnormal mean cell volume MCV, low MCV and low MCH that indicates hypochromic and microcytic type of anemia. Also, it can show the low hemoglobin and also hematrochic level. Uh, next, okay, we can... Uh, do, uh, have, have I told you that I, uh, the other day that I hate the word can? Yeah, you can do for black count. Yeah, you can do many other things. When you see you can money, buat bumbule, tak buat bumbule. But full blood count is necessary. You want to diagnose anemia, you have to do full blood count. So you should say, okay, patient, full blood count should be done, not can be done. You understand? Katan, the difference between boleh buat dengan patut dibuat. Ya, kalau kata, oh, full blood count, boleh buat, kita boleh buat dengan full blood count. Money, buat pun tak apa, tak buat pun tak apa. But if you say, kita patut buat, kita mesti buat full blood count in patient who have anemia. Because you need to confirm, how else you want to confirm that there is anemia? And then you want to know the diagnosis, you have to look at the MCV, you have to look at MCH. So as far as possible, try not to use the word can. Right? Even mm -hmm. when we do MCQs also, we never use the word can. Because you do not can mania, mesti betul mania. It's a patient with iron deficiency anemia. We can give Coca Cola. Of course, you can give Coca Cola. Tapi, does it help? Is it useful? Must you give Coca Cola? No. So, don't use the word can. Yeah. All right, Ralph. All right. Okay, continue with the uh, other test, which is. Uh... Start with full blood count again. Don't use the word can. All right, okay, for uh, diagnostic uh, clues or investigation, food blood, count should, food, food blood count should be done in order for us to know the, uh, in order to, 
in order for us to classify the anemia. So it, 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 will, indi uh, it will indicate hypochromic microcytic if the value of the MCV and MCH, uh, MCV and MCH is low. Uh, also in the patient with iron deficiency anemia, uh, the hemoglobin and hematocrit level will also be low. Next is the peripheral okay. blood. When a, when a patient comes with anemia, they do full blood count because number one, you want to see whether there's an anemia or not. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then number two, you want to see whether this is a single lineage or multiple lineage. Many anemia alone are top of all the other three lineage, the white blood cell lineage, whether the platelet are involved or not. So it's not just looking at this. Yeah? For example, full mm -hmm. blood count shows low hemoglobin, but it shows uh, show low platelet and low WBC, then it's pancytopenia, then your diagnosis is different. If it shows anemia and uh, normal WBC and uh, uh, high platelet, yeah, may suggest other diagnosis. So when you discuss this, you should discuss in full. The total white count, is it normal or not in patient with uh, high inefficiency anemia? Uh, normal. What about the platelet count? Normal. Well, the count is usually normal, but it can be elevated as well. Yeah? So if you see a patient with anemia, hypochromic microcytic, the platelet is 500,000, for example, it's more likely to be iron deficiency anemia than thalassemia. Right? So right. your discussion will have to be much deeper than that. Okay. okay. All right, Prof. Uh, Continue with the peripheral blood smear. It will show the uh, microcytosis, which is the size of the red blood cell, uh, uh, smaller, and the uh, red blood cell has uh, more central pylor. Uh, I'll show the picture in the next slide. Next, we can, uh, sorry. So uh, what, what do you call that, more central pylor? Hypochromesia, isn't it? Hypochromic. Hypochromesia. Yeah? Yes. Right, uh, okay. so, uh, so this central pylor uh, shows that uh, there's a low hemoglobin level uh, that gives the red pigment of the red pigment in the red blood cells. Next is iron study. It shows that the uh, level of the ferritin and serum iron is low, and it, show, uh, it also shows the high total iron by decapacity. This is due to uh, disruption of the iron supply and iron depletion, iron store depletion. Next, bone marrow aspiration. Bone marrow aspiration or pearl stain uh, can uh, may be diagnostic of iron deficiency, but has been largely displaced in diagnosis of iron deficiency by the serum iron, uh, total iron by decapacity, and also ferritin testing. But uh, bone marrow uh, aspiration will stain the iron, uh, uh, the iron store in the bone marrow. So less bluish will indicate less, less iron. Uh, so why is it uh, uh, abandoned now? Why is it not done? Because it is quite invasive. Uh, because it is invasive, it is costly, you have to put the patient under sedation and so on. Yeah? Yes. Okay, again, bring for full blood count, what are the other parameters that you uh, look at? Uh, what blood cell? Apart from what blood cell player, yeah, we have discussed that. What reticulocyte? Yes, reticulocyte count is useful as well, isn't it? What would the reticulocyte count be? Low or normal or high? Uh, low. Uh... Yeah, below. Anything else? Um, there is RDW. Do you know what RDW uh, is? Red cell distribution width. Yeah, so what Stance. happens in iron chinchin Uh, It will be low. What is meant by red cell distribution width? Uh, This is the, dist uh, the distribution, the variation in distribution. Okay. Oh. For example, if you take your classroom, you can take your height distribution with. If everybody is the same height and all that, 
then the height discipline width is very narrow. But if there are some very tall, some very short, then the height discipline width is very wide, very high. If you want to take the width of your, page, of your friends in the class, for example, if all has about the same width, boys and girls and all that, that means the weight discipline width is very narrow. But if they're a fat one, a thin one and all that, then the weight discipline width is very wide. So similarly, when you talk about great cell distribution width, it is high in uh, iron chan chi. Why? Mm, because the, there's a variable size and shape. Yeah, of, so uh, size variable of size, size and shapes. So that's the thing you will see in favor blood film. You will see variable size. So what do you call that variable size? Any show cytosis, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You see, any show cytosis, variable size and shape. Yeah. So there are many other things, target cells also, which you can see. So again, this is not adequate uh, information. That for blood smear, number one, you want to see absence of abnormal cells, no blood and all that. And then you'll see that uh, there is microcytosis, and then there is uh, hypochromic, uh, uh, hypochromasia as well. There's poikilocytosis, and then there's anisocytosis, and then you may have target cells. Yeah? You must give full description because sometimes in the exam you say, okay, give four characteristic features of a blood film in a iron chinchy anemia. Kalau you cakap ke kawan dia ada dua je, then your friend will only get 50%. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so this is the uh, examples of the peripheral blood sphere that shows the central pillar of RBC and also yeah. the... Use the pointer, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> and also, uh, at the bottom right picture shows the okay, bone marrow central pillow, aspiration. All red blood cells, we have center pillow, isn't it? Yes. yes. So, you think there is center pillow then? So what? All red blood cells have center pillow because they are biconcave. Uh, in iron deficiency anemia, the red blood cells uh, will be uh, more uh, more, more central pillow. Yeah. So that means if you take the radius from the center to the side of the red blood cells, okay, the dark color is less than one third of the radius. Mm. You all know what is meant by radius? Yes. Okay, so you take the center and you draw a line to the side and the darkness there is less than one third of the radius. So that's mm. hypochromasia. Mm. So what else can you see? The what, variability what? in size and shape. Okay, so can you show some of the shapes, some of the size, some small, some big and all that. And there's target cells as well. There's pencil cell, yeah? You can see pencil yeah. cells. And then the RBCs are small as well, isn't it? It's less than half the size of the neutrophil. You can see neutrophil there. Yes. Then usually you compare with the lymphocytes. Usually slightly bigger than lymphocytes. So if you compare with the lymphocytes, which is the same size as lymphocytes, then it is microcytosis. You may see lymphocytes there at two o'clock, right? Okay? And the corner, mm -hmm. upper corner on the right hand side. The dark one there. That could be lymphocytes. So you look at the RBCs, most of them are about the size of the lymphocytes. <clears throat> yeah, okay. so, uh, so the picture, uh, sorry, I don't have pointer. So uh, the picture yeah, at the computer, bottom, right? Your computer will have the pointer. Uh, I use my phone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, your phone so, doesn't have pointer. No. Because uh, I use, uh, uh, yeah. What brand is your phone? Uh, <laughs> uh, iPhone, but uh, I use iPhone. the PDF phone, uh, PDF form, so I can't. Uh, and use point. the adjective touch. What? Okay. 
Chào các bạn ạ. Ok, tập các bạn. Rồi, 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 rồi. Guna pen kot boleh? Tak payahlah, tak apalah. Tahu sekarang nak belajar, tak payahlah. Baik, okay. Uh, so, the picture at the bottom right side, on the left, uh, is the normal uh, normal bone marrow aspiration. And the uh, on the right side is the abnormal bone marrow aspiration. So less bluish indicates there's less iron stars in the bone marrow. Hmm. So uh, uh, these are the, on the left side is the laboratory findings uh, compared between the iron deficiency and also anemia, anemia of the chronic disease. So the uh, MCV, MCH is low and the level of iron and ferritin is also low uh, and transferring which is uh, used to transport the iron uh, is high because of iron depletion. Uh, so on management, uh, first uh, nutritional counseling uh, is advisable to do nutritional counseling or dietary advice uh, if the baby is breastfed, so maintain the breastfeeding and use the iron fortified cereals to strengthen and uh, as a iron supplement. Next is oral iron medication, which is the syrup F, uh, FEC, ferrous ammonium citrate. Uh, the usual therapy dose is six milligram per day of elemental iron. Uh, and it, it is continued six to eight weeks uh, after normal hemoglobin level is restored. Uh, and ferrous fumarate is also uh, one of the iron supplement that can be used to uh, treat uh, iron deficiency. Uh, other than that, uh, these are sources of iron that can use uh, as the natural food intake to uh, to uh, to increase the iron uh, iron intake, which is uh, like meat, raisins, beans. Peanuts, uh, broccoli, sardines, uh, uh, and also egg. So there are foods to avoid in excess in toddlers, such as cow milk, tea, uh, which contains tannin, which is the chemical compound that gives the bitter flavor of the tea that inhibit iron uptake. Also in high fiber food, which is phytates, is also in inhibit and interfere iron absorption uh, and inter interfere with the gut absorption. So, uh, so these are example of cases uh, that I've obtained in Nelson's pediatrics book, which uh, shows iron deficiency anemia, which is Aisha, age two years, was noted to look pale, and attended uh, her general practitioner for an upper respiratory tract infection. Blood count shows that, that uh, low hemoglobin level, five gram per deciliter. Uh, severe and MCH 16, uh, MCV 54 and MCH 16 also low. She was drinking a, three pints of cow's milk per day and was a very uh, fizzy eater, refusing meat. She had started eating soil while playing in the garden, which uh, also known as pika. So uh, the solution, uh, this shows that the patient uh, have a, a pain Low, blood, uh, low hemoglobin level, low MCV and MCH, and also uh, excess intake of uh, cow's milk shows excessive intake of uh, iron sources, and also uh, started eating soy or pika. So because of the- uh, Excessive uh, cow's milk? Uh, that means excessive iron, is it? In your last no. slide, I think your second and third slide, you said that uh, cow's milk contain only 0 0.5. Uh, yes. It's the lowest. Can you go back? Mm. Yeah, this one. That yeah, cow's milk, 0 0.5 milligram per liter compared to breast milk. And then the absorption, the bioavailability is poor as well. Only 10% is absorbed. Mm. So how can you say excess cow's milk and all that uh, enough iron? Oh, go 
Okay, can. Uh, so, uh, SS Carl Smith. Uh, oh, oh, three pins of Carl Smith. Uh, it means that uh, she... Uh, she for, one, uh, one, one, one pine is how many cc? One pine. One pine is 500 cc. So three pines is 1,500 cc. Two year old, what's the usual weight for a two year old? Twenty kilogram, fifteen kilogram. Let's say it's fifteen kilogram. That's what the fluid requirement. One thousand two hundred. Uh, about one thousand two hundred. Then this uh, girl is taking one thousand five hundred of cow's milk. Mm -hmm. So when you take one thousand five hundred of cow's milk, you'll be full. Your stomach full of water already. You will then you will not want to eat solid. Yeah, so it's not eating meat and all that. So we're talking about cow's milk here. It's not formula milk. So there is formula milk which originate from cow's milk. That one is fortified. The iron will be increased, everything, they add vitamin and so on. But when we talk about cow's milk, that means cow's milk from the cow. Uh, the cow, you just made the cow, put inside the bottle, and this is sold in supermarket in some countries. So that one, not enough iron. And the bioavailability only 10% is absorbed. And most of the drinks is coming from the cow. So that is definitely inadequate iron. Huh? Mm. All right. All right, Prof. Uh, so because of uh, she's decaying three pints of cow's milk per day, so she has inappropriately large volume of milk drinking, so was not sufficient hungry to eat solid food. So uh, the solution and the management for this uh, child is replacing some of the milk with iron-rich food and also treatment with the uh, uh, oral iron produce, that uh, oral iron uh, supplement, which, which will raise the hemoglobin and also stop the PICA, uh, PICA behavior. So oral iron was continued until her hemoglobin uh, had been normal for three months. Uh, why want to give for more than three months? For three months? Uh, because sometimes the uh, the hem I mean the restoration of the iron is not completed, although the hemoglobin level has been normal. Sometimes. Uh, what do you mean by sometimes? Sometimes I brush my teeth. Sometimes I don't brush my teeth. What does that mean? Once a week you brush, or twice a week? Three times a week, six times a week. It's not some time. It's all the time. So what happened in iron deficiency anemia? Initially, the storage is depleted. And then subsequently, the serum ferritin will come down. And then anemia, patient will have anemia. But when you treat, it is the other way around. The anemia will come up first. And then the serum ferritin will come up. And then the stores will be repeated. So that's why when the hemoglobin come up normal, doesn't mean that the stores has been repeated. Yeah, it has to be continued for at least two months before the stores. So all you have to give for about three months. One month for the hemoglobin to come up. Yeah, to normal. And then another one month, another uh, six to eight weeks for the stores to come back. Hemoglobin will increase by one gram every two weeks. Yeah, one gram per deciliter every two weeks. So after four weeks, after six weeks, you'll come up by six. Three weeks, six weeks, you'll come up by three, yeah? So in hemoglobin, it's nearly seven, then it'll come to 10 after about six weeks. Yeah? And then you need another six weeks to restore the, the storage of the iron. 
right? Okay, so it's not some time. It is all the time. That's why the recommendation is three months. So I'll proceed with the megal uh, another type of nutrition anemia, which is the megaloblastic anemia. So based on uh, epidemiology, it is more common in developing countries because of malnutrition. The principal causes of the megaloblastic What do you mean by common? More common than iron deficiency anemia or more common compared to in developed countries? Uh, more common in developing countries compared to developed countries. Okay, but it is not common. Okay. Yeah. It is not common. The commonness in developing countries is iron deficiency anemia. Folate is not common. B12 is very uncommon. Okay. So in my 30 years of practice, maybe I see less than 10 patient with megaloblastic anemia and very few patients with folate deficiency. More than B12 because of the, because patient is on back three, which is anti-folate. And some patient are on goat's milk and goat's milk can cause folate deficiency. So this subject, you may need not, you don't have to go into detail. How many, how many slides you have for this megaloblastic anemia? Uh, five. Okay, five slides. Okay, I like, can go very fast. Yeah. Uh, so the principal causes of megaloblastic anemia is due to vitamin B12 and also folate deficiency. Both of these vitamins essential for DNA synthesis and can cause impact in hematopoiesis. Uh, so the pathogenesis of the uh, megaloblastic anemia is uh, the underlying mechanism is. Uh, impairment of the DNA synthesis, then, uh, and it will cause delay in the nuclear maturation and also cell division. But others that succeed in giving rise to some of the matures are resist, but because of fewer cell division, so the, to uh, the total output from this precursor is diminished. Uh, as a result, uh, some of the megaloblasts uh, that defective will undergo apoptosis in bone marrow. Uh, without producing any RBCs, which known as ineffective erythro uh, hematopoiesis. Uh, others that succeed in giving rise to RBCs, uh, which is uh, only in a fewer cells division, uh, but still the total output uh, is diminished. So as a result, uh, patient with megaloblast anemia exhibit pancytopenia, which is shows uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and granulocytopenia, which shows low count of all three blood cell lineage. Uh, uh, so both of these vitamin B12 and also uh, and also folate involved in uh, producing the, the uh, in methylation process of DNA or uh, DNA synthesis to synthesis the uh, building blocks of DNA, which is purine and also thymidylates. Uh, so folic acid deficiency, uh, clinically significant in those with poor diet, which is economically deprived or elderly, and increase in metabolic needs such as pregnant women. So folic acid stores is limited, and it shows deficiency when there's, there's inadequate folate intake over three months period. Uh, so folate, uh, man, uh, pre, uh, folate usually present in all food, but can easily be destroyed by ten to fifteen minutes of cooking. So some of the sources of the folate uh, is fresh and fresh, fresh uncooked vegetables and fruits. So the clinical features with folic acid deficiency is a uh, sign and symptom of anemia, which is weakness, easy fatigue, shortness of breath, decreased appetite, and pallor. But some of the severe deficiency can cause uh, the manifestation of sore tongue. So uh, the causes of folic acid deficiency can be due to inadequate dietary intake, increased requirement, and also use of folic antagonists, which is methotrexate, which, which this uh, methotrexate will involve in inhibit the folic metabolism in DNA synthesis. Okay. Uh, so uh, you see, Clinical, clinically significant in those with elderly pregnant women. So it's not common in children, like I said, yeah? Uh, yeah. 
and uh, the storage is uh, the availability in the stores and that is longer. It takes longer for the foliage stores to be depleted. Yeah? So that's why it is not very common. B12 Japanese stores lagi lama to be depleted and all that. Many more months. I'm sure you will tell us afterwards. So basically, the causes in that great intake, the most common, like I said, is use of folate antagonists. I am an oncologist, so we use a lot of metal acid patient with leukemia, and we put them on back cream as well, which is antifolate. Yeah, we put on back cream for flexis for a long time, leukemia patient. So because of that, they may have folate deficiency, they may have anemia. What's the importance of giving folate to pregnant women? Uh, for the DNA synthesis of the baby. DNA synthesis of the baby. Mm -hmm. tida, uh, then the baby will not uh, not have any DNA, is it? Two things for anemia to prevent anemia, because there is increased requirement, and the other one is neural tube defect, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know this patient with neural tube defect. So if uh, there's inadequate folate in the mother, then there is a high risk of getting neural tube defect. Spina bifida, yeah? And hydrocephalus. Okay. Uh, so a person with the vitamin B12 or no, also known as cobalamin deficiency, uh, so, inadequate levels of uh, this B12 vitamin result in megaloblastic microcytic anemia similar to folate deficiency. However, vitamin B12 deficiency can also cause demyelinating disorder that involve in peripheral nerve or also spinal cord. Uh, basically, vitamin B12 uh, sources is main, uh, main, mainly from meat and fish and it is stored in liver. Uh, it is uh, quite plentiful uh, in uh, individuals to be sustained for years. Uh, differ from the uh, from the folic acid, it is resistant to cooking or boiling. Uh, so uh, it also known as pernicious anemia, which is used to describe vitamin B twelve deficiency result from inadequate gastric production or defective function of intrinsic factor. The function of intrinsic factor is to absorb vitamin B12. Uh, so vitamin B12 are bound to intrinsic factor. So due to defect in the intrinsic factor, it can fail to absorb vitamin B12. Uh, some of the clinical features uh, manifest is sign and symptom of anemia. Uh, so tongue for severe and neuropathy as what I've said just now can cause the demyelination of the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord that can cause the lost position and also vibratory sensation in the lower extremities or ataxia. Uh, another clinical features uh, is developmental delay and irritability and weakness. Uh, this is uh, if the deficiency is quite severe. The causes of the vitamin B12 deficiency mainly is the pernicious anemia, which is lack of intrinsic factor, digestive disease or malabsorption, such as the celiac disease, and also poorly diet. As we all know, the vitamin B12, the main, main source is meat and fish, so this poorly diet is strict to the vegan diet. Okay, just like folate uh, deficiency in patients take uh, goat's milk, yeah? Because now it is fashionable. Some of the children, the mother, instead of giving cow's milk, give goat's milk. And this is goat's milk, which is direct from the goat. That means it is not been fortified, not added iron, not added vitamins, and so on. So they are prone to get folic deficiency. Okay. Uh, so the investigation that can be uh, that uh, will be performed for folate deficiency is uh, first is full blood count, which uh, indicates low hemoglobin level for uh, anemia, and uh, as the megaloblastic anemia, the the MCH will be normal, but the MCV will be high, so it will shows the macrocytic. Uh, and in peripheral blood smear, it will show the hypersegmented neutrophils in the peripheral blood. And also, as you can see at the pictures at the bottom right side, 
uh, it shows the enlarged erythrocyte and also macro macrocyte or ovalocyte, eight shape site, eight shape size of uh, erythrocyte. Uh, next, with uh, bone marrow aspiration, also can uh, also can be done, but uh, it's quite uh, displaced by others. Uh, but uh, if there, uh, if bone marrow aspiration uh, has been done, it can show markedly hypercellular with megaloblastic erythroid progenitors of uh, with immature nuclei. Uh, as a picture here, this is the comparison between the normal blast on the left and also megaloblast uh, on the right uh, from the bone marrow aspirate. So these megaloblasts are larger and have uh, immature nuclei and also finely reticulated chromatin and abundant of basophilic cytoplasm compared to the normal blast. Uh, next, we can um, next serum B12 and folate level is also. Uh, uh, done for to differentiate uh, between the deficiencies deficiency between the vitamin B12 and folate level, uh, and for pernicious anemia, uh, intrinsic factor and parietal cell activities can be detected for pernicious anemia. Uh, so lastly, the management is uh, mainly the cobalamin and folate therapy which is vitamin B12 and folic acid supplements. Uh, other than that, the natural food that contain vitamin B12 and folate, mainly the folate uh, food rich in uh, such as vegetables, dark leaf and also papaya. The source of vitamin B12 is like meat, fish and also uh, meat and fish mainly. So uh, that's all for me. Okay, any questions? So folate and B12, not very common. Uh, you don't have uh, to know that much about it. Maybe one star only, but high efficiency is very common. Yeah? The commonest cause of anemia uh, in children is iron efficiency globally, worldwide. So you must know how to investigate and how to diagnose and how to manage. Okay, any questions about iron deficiency? No. Okay. No question, then we can move to the second speaker. Now, Patin, you took about one hour for your seminar. Okay, who's the next speaker? Okay, uh, my name is Izian. So I will be the next speaker. So um, can I have uh, Al Hakim to? Uh, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, yes. love, uh, today I love you, got Al, Al Hakim lah. I I know, it's not. Uh, uh, Al Hakim help me to uh, share my slide because I have oh. problem with my laptop. So, kenapa Allah came to the I love you, guys. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Assalam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Zian Fateha binti Saidi. So, today I will be presenting about a plastic anemia. So, uh, next. So, how long are you going to take? How many slides have you got? A plastic anemia. I have uh, around 20. 20. So, another one hour. Phew. Uh, Shall I? Okay. So this uh, this is the outline of my presentation. Okay. So next. So I uh, uh, we will start with the definitions of a, a plastic anemia. It is a non-neoplastic condition of bone marrow hypoplasia result from defective hemopoietic stem cell. And uh, the main important point is it is characterized by pancytopenia uh, with uh, bone marrow hypo. So actually, the term uh, aplastic anemia itself, uh, it, it, anemia, it just refers to low red blood count, um, but it's actually it is uh, misnomer. So it actually, it's, it should be uh, aplastic pancytopenia. So aplastic uh, 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 aplastic anemia also known as bone marrow failure. So as we can see in the picture, um, the uh, the 
the uh, comparison between the normal blood cell and normal plastic anemia uh, cell, there is reduction in all the three series of uh, of uh, blood cells. So there is low white blood cells, uh, red blood cells, and also platelet. Okay, next. So and uh, move on, moving on to the epidemiology. So uh, and the incidence of uh, epileptic anemia it is approximately five cases per million in uh, per million population in a year. It is a rare uh, con uh, disease and it is more common in Asia compared to in the West. And uh, both uh, men and female, uh, and the the occurrence uh, is the same. And it also can occur in all age of the group. Uh, peak uh, incident at in 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 teens and also in the twenties, uh, in fifteen to twenty five years old, and also in elderly sixty five to seventy years old. For inherited form, uh, the peak incidence can occur in uh, at age five to ten years old of age. Okay, nice. Um, so for the etiology, it can be divided into primary and secondary causes. So for for primary, uh, almost sixty uh, percent of the cases is uh, adiabatic. It is unknown. And for inherited, uh, the most common uh, inherited uh, inherited in inherited form is Fanconi anemia. It also can be due to such such men Diamond syndrome and also dyskeratosis congenita. So for secondary, so these, are, these are just three examples, right? So there are many other yes. causes. Yeah? Yes, yes. So commonness is thankfully, right? Okay. Okay, for secondary uh, causes, 30% uh, of the uh, it's only contribute to 30% of the cases. It includes radiation, uh, drugs such as uh, cytotoxic drug, antibiotics, antithyroid, anticonvulsion, antiromantic, and acid. Um, and exposure to chemical also can cause. Uh, uh, aplastic anemia, such as benzene or glue sniffing. Um, uh, other than that, um, aplastic anemia also can arise due to infection. Uh, the most common infection is due to viral hepatitis, but the the specific uh, types of viral hepatitis is unknown. Uh, the uh, the A uh, hepatitis A, B, and C is not uh, the culprit. So it also can do, be due to infections of uh, due to uh, cytomegalovirus, HIV, Epstein-Barr virus, and also parvovirus B19. Other other causes is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, but it is a stem cell uh, stem cell disorder that um that can that cause the membrane of the blood cells uh susceptible to lysis. And it is uh, the symptoms is uh, there will be a dark or bright uh, color, uh, dark or bright, uh, bl bright red blood in urine, uh, in at the night or at night or at uh, or in morning. So other 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 causes may be due to pregnancy, but it very rare uh, and it will resolve with um, delivery. Okay, next. So I will. Uh, Briefly, uh, talk about Fakoni anemia. So Fakoni anemia, as I mentioned before, it is the common, uh, common, commonest, uh, cause, uh, the commonest inherited form of epilepsy anemia. Okay. So, even, um, even though it, it is, it is the commonest, it is still very, very, very. How many slides have we got on Fakoni? It's very rare. This is postgraduate. I only see uh, Fakoni anemia I'm, because I'm working in a hematology unit, and because okay, we do bone uh, marrow transplant for Fakoni. Otherwise, I think most, even average pediatrician would not even see one single case of Fanconi. So how many slides have we got on Fanconi? Only this slide. Only this slide, Only okay. This. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, Fanconi anemia, um, no, okay. Fanconi anemia is a defective uh, DNA repair that causes break uh, of the chromosome and it is an autosomal recessive disorder uh, condition. The kind of uh, features, uh, patient may pay such a uh, short stature, ab ab abnormal in uh, radar and thumbs, renal malfunction, and also microthalmia and pigmented skin lesion, or also no cathode outlay. And these uh, clinical features usually appear until the age of five or five, six years. Uh, years. And uh, for chronic anemia, usually the patient, uh, this disease, it um, has high risk to transform to NSC, which is acute 
alkimia, Milo alkimia. Okay, next. Um, okay, next. Um, for Sachuan Diamonds uh, syndrome, it is a uh, autosomal recessive disorder. It's also rare. Uh, it is characterized by bone uh, marrow failure. Okay, this is of... much more uh, rare than fake. Rare. So, okay. just done it for you to. Uh, to... Okay, okay, we can see this slide. Okay, for physiology of bone marrow failure, um, it is uh, actually it is uh, not fully understood, but uh, it, it is believed that immune mechanism uh, pro probably uh, responsible in in most of the cases. So um, when there is uh, environment insult in virus uh, or drug or uh, chemical, it will or any genetic disorder, it can cause uh, alter in stem cell in stem cell. And the stem cell will express new antigen that uh, will evoke autoimmune uh, response. So the T cell will re respond to the new antigen and produce uh, in interfering gamma and also tumor, tumor ne necrotic factor that can cause marrow aplasia. Other than that, the damage Cell cell, it also can reduce proliferation of uh, at the proliferative capacity, then also can, uh, leads to marrow aplasia. Okay, so moving on to the, the clinical features of aplastic anemia, it uh, in, include all the symptoms of anemia, such as fatigue, uh, weakness, pallor, and also shortness of breath. Uh, recurrent infection also occurred due to low uh, white blood uh, white blood cell. And, uh, and because our body is able to fight off the infection. So uh, due to thrombocytopenia, the patient uh, might have a uh, bleeding tendency with, that will manifest with mucosal bleeding, PTK, and also ecchymosis. Okay, the next slide. Uh, and need to, uh, be remem and need to remember that there is no enlargement of lymph node, liver, and spleen because, uh, and if it, present, we need to consider uh, other causes of pancytopenia. Okay, next. So for investigation, uh, we should do a full blood, pi uh, flat, uh, blood picture if aplastic anemia is suspected. So uh, in full blood, uh, so the full blood, full blood count, so uh, the result um, patient may have anemia with low hemoglobin less than uh, 10 gram per deciliter, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, and the, uh, the it is normal chromic normocyte types of anemia with normal MCV and MCH. And there's also low reticulocyte that indicate that there is low uh, red blood cell production. Okay, move on to the next slide. Okay, or uh, other than that, we also uh, uh, should do blood sperm uh, and in blood film, it is, uh, it can, can call a boring blood film because there is no abnormal or immature cell. And uh, as before, it is a normal chromic normocytic, and it may be microcytic types of, uh, uh, in uh, micro microcytic, uh, with no any cell poikilocytosis. Why it is uh, microcytic? It may be due to, uh, as I mentioned before, it is uh, bone marrow failure to proliferate and uh, div uh, divide the cells. So uh, the microcytic types, it might be the uh, progenitor, progenitor cells. So as we know, the first, uh, the progenitor cell is much more larger than um, the mature RBC. Okay. And uh, there will be reduced in number of platelet and uh, white blood cell with normal morphology. So it was, as we can see in the picture, the differences, uh, it is same as the first slide that I show you. So next. So for, uh, okay, uh, bone marrow examination is very uh, important to be done because it is a confirm, common, uh, to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, so we, uh, we can do, uh, we should do bone marrow aspirate. So we can see hypostodal marrow uh, and on most of the hemopoietic stem cell, it's already replaced by fat cell. And uh, the, eritro the, the erythroid uh, granulo granulocytic progressive cells and megakaryotes are reduced. So, and uh, chiffin uh, by itself also 
should be done yeah, to get more accurate assessment of the cellularity. Uh, same, same, and it, it will be appear hemocellularity and reduction in hemopoietic element and also activity. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. Um, so for management, first, uh, it, we need to identify, identify and eliminate the underlying causes. For example, if it is due to drug, chemical, or toxin, so we need to stop the the using the use of the drug, and um, and then uh, we should give supportive treatment in order to um, uh, admit the symptoms that appear. Uh, first, for anemia, we in severe anemia, we can we should give uh, blood transfusion, uh, bone marrow stimulants uh, such as androgens and to uh, stimulate the production uh, the hemopoietic process. Hemopoiesis. Uh, for in thrombocytopenia, we should give platelet transfusion and should avoid uh, trauma, uh, because uh, it, uh, patient who have uh, aplastic anemia, they they and they have high 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 risk of bleeding. For infection, we uh, we should give pro uh, to treat infection. We should give prophylactic antibiotics. So uh, uh, we also have a specific treatment. For, to treat aplastic anemia, um, and the most um, a treatment of choice is hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. So usually it is uh, given a young uh, in, to given to patient with uh, severe anemia uh, and age below than forty years old, and it also we also can give. Uh, um, I think uh, we should move to the next slide because I need to explain that. Okay, the hemopoietic uh, stem cell uh, it is, uh, as I mentioned, it is uh, given to uh, severe aplastic anemia patient. So there's the characteristic of uh, a severe aplastic anemia. So the stem cell, it is from a sibling with identical HLA and compatible mixed lymphocyte. And uh, the survival rate is about 80, uh, more than 80%. If it is given before, uh, if given before the recipient recipient is synthesized to blood product, because the uh, transfusion blood transfusion, it can synthesize uh, sensitize um sensitize uh, uh, pas uh patient uh, synthesize. I think, I think the detail is not uh, necessary, yeah, because uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant now there's so much advances. For example, now you can use an later, you can use partial mesh and all that, but there's so much mm -hmm. advances. And it's just not to suffice for you to know that one of the treatment is hemopoietic stem cell transplant. Last time you call it bone marrow transplant, now it's called mm -hmm. hemopoietic stem cell. And this is yeah. the recommended treatment for severe hemolytic anemia. Yeah. Huh? Uh, can, I, can we move to? Can you go back uh, one slide uh, back? One slide before, yes. Okay, so the treatment for moderate aplastic anemia is immunosuppressive therapy. So it's a combination of, yeah, because if you see that pathophysiology just now, you showed that it could be due to immune, yeah, because new receptors and also autoimmune as well. So that's why you give immunosuppressive. Uh, the anti thymocyte globulin usually, not AL, not ALTG, it's anti thymocyte. Mm -hmm. And this is not anti thymocyte alone, it's combined with steroid, combined with cyclosporin. Hemopoietic growth factors is just like manual, yeah, to increase the count. And this is usually given in patients with Fanconi, for example. First choice, you give a uh, uh, GCSF, granulocyte uh, stimulating factor, yeah, before we do transplant. Usually, finally, they will need bone marrow transplant as well. Okay. And uh, steroid alone, androgens and all that, it is useful in one category of the plastic anemia which affects the red blood cell load. Do you know what it is? Isian. Uh, uh, Isian, yeah. So yes. do you know which type of plastic anemia affects the red blood cell load? Uh, uh, poor red blood cell Pure red cell aplasia. Yeah, PRA, pure red okay. cell aplasia. That means it affects only the red cell. This is also called the diamond black fan syndrome. And okay. that patient usually will respond to steroid very well. 
if they don't respond to steroid, generally you do bone marrow transplant. So basically, what you need to remember specific treatment, bone marrow transplant or immunosuppressive therapy or steroid, yeah, depending on the case, depending on severity, and then supportive treatment, yeah, because of pancytopenia, they may require transfusion and so on. Yes, okay, carry on. Okay, for complication, if it is left untreated, uh, uh, there will be uncontrolled bleeding, severe infection, also heart failure due to severe anemia, and graft versus host disease uh, when the engraftment of the bone marrow is failed. So moving on to the next slide. So this is the different, differential diagnosis for pancytopenia. It can be due to bone marrow infiltration due to malignancy and, and malignancy such as lymphoma or any mass that uh, occur at the bone, bone, bone marrow. Uh, it also can be due to uh, melodysplastic syndrome, megaloblastic anemia, melofibrosis infection, uh, PNH, and also hemophagotic syndrome. So next, uh, for prognosis, it is unpredictable, and the idiopathic one is will carry the more, the the poor uh, prognosis if it, it is left untreated and uh, the bad prognosis, of course, in severe aplastic anemia and the bone uh, marrow uh, transplant is often uh, creative with, um, with 75 to 90% of survival. Okay, uh, next. Oh, so this is the example of cases that I found in website. Uh, actually, this um, uh, case, it is um, plastic anemia associated with celiac, uh, celiac disease because uh, they, they find that the, uh, the mechanism, uh, it involves autosomal, uh, no, it involves uh, autoimmune, uh, similar uh, autoimmune involved in the mechanism mechanism of both disease. So, uh, uh, there is a, a six years old Asian girl presented with generalized bruise, undocumented fever, and eczematous rashes for one year duration, and she, and she have several low stool and also loss of appetite. In the investigation, uh, the investigation reveals that. Um, the hemoglobin level is low, platelet count uh, also low, and mean count, uh, MCV and MCH uh, is normal. Uh, both are normal. And there is no atypical uh, result. Um, because of these children, it has uh, a few features of fecal anemia. Uh, so doctors decide to do an mitomycin C test, but it appeared negative. So it and it is to just to rule out the fecal anemia. So on uh, evaluation, she, she was diagnosed as uh, celiac disease. And then she was ma managed with antibiotic, fat, uh, red blood cells, and pl platelet support, and also to put on a gluten-free diet because um, one of uh, the causes uh, to have celiac disease is, to, uh, is due to intake of gluten diet. So, and then she was discharged. But in 2016, uh, she she was and then she was presented with a non -pro, non productive uh, cough fever respiratory distress, distress for two months and a history of recurring infection for over the past year um, and her hemoglobin also appeared low and uh, because uh, leukocyte low platelet low so this is uh, pancytopenia so she, and then she, uh, she uh, no I I forget to uh, write there and uh, the doctor do the trephine, uh, tre Traffin uh, biopsy, and then uh, there there is uh, there was um, hypocerity of the bone marrow, and then she was managed with uh, packed red, red cell platelets and diet restriction due to celiac disease, and have uh, improved the uh, and the and patient is improving, and her parents were cons uh, uh, is suggested to uh, to to have bone marrow uh, transplant. To this, uh, to the doctor. So what's so, the final diagnosis in this patient? Uh, they have uh, a plastic anemia associated with celiac disease. So this is not this is acquired a plastic anemia, right? Yeah, and acquired yeah. so anemia can divide into idiopathic. So idiopathic. The common and... common cause of uh, the commonest type of uh, a plastic anemia is is uh, is secondary plastic anemia, right? 
Mm -hmm. Not inherited. Inherited is much rarer. Uh, so most, more than two thirds, about 60%, like what you showed just now, is due to mm -hmm. secondary causes. And secondary mm -hmm. causes, again, another 60%, you do not know what the cause are. Only a few that you know what the causes are. And the causes can be due to passion, can be due to drugs, can be due to radiation. So this is secondary hepatic anemia. But it is not hepatic because we know what the cause is. It is actually to be select disease. Okay. Yeah. So is this severe or non-severe? Uh, non-severe. It's non-severe because leukocyte count is quite high. Yeah, three point five. So okay. for severe type, the, the leukocyte count or the absolute neutrophil count is much lesser than this. Yeah, I okay. think zero point five, five hundred is severe. And less than 200 is very severe. Yeah, and 500 to 1,500 is considered as a moderate plastic anemia. So actually, there is no indication for the patient to have bone marrow transplant because this patient is not severe in plastic anemia. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. This is my uh, references. So that's all from me. Okay. Any questions? So again, aplastic anemia is not very common, but when a patient comes with anemia, okay, the teaching, uh, the standard thing that you have to do is to do full blood count to know whether this is single lineage or triple lineage. If it's triple lineage, it's pancytopenia. That pancytopenia, you have to suspect whether it is bone marrow infiltration or bone marrow failure. Bone marrow infiltration, you may have hepatosplenomegaly, lymph adenopathy, but in the absence of all that, then most likely it is bone marrow failure. Bone marrow failure, that means aplastic anemia, you have to decide whether this is hereditary or whether this is idiopathic. Hereditary may have some dysmorphic features. For example, patient with Fanconi may have some problem. Yeah, this is the commonest one. They have short stature, they have uh, hyperpigmentation and so on. So if you don't have uh, all those features, most likely it is idiopathic. Uh, and idiopathic, you should try and find out what is the possible cause of this disease, whether there's any radiation, whether there's any drug, whether there's any previous infection before. Uh, yeah. And to confirm the diagnosis, you have to do bone marrow aspiration. And based on that, you can divide into whether it is mild, moderate, or severe, or very severe. Very severe, bone marrow transplant. Moderate and se severe, you may try uh, immunosuppressive therapy first. Yeah? doesn't work, then uh, you can do bone marrow transplant. Okay. 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 Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Regarding the investigation, so we can do bone marrow aspirate or... Who is, who is asking the question? My name is Noah Okay, show, show your face. Okay, sorry. Uh, because uh, we don't want your sister, your mother, your grandmother to ask the question. You must see your face, see you opening your mouth and closing your mouth. Tak ada. Mana muka? Nak, nak pergi pakai makeup dulu ke? Nak mandi dulu or what? We can wait for 20 minutes if you want to. Oh, mandi. Sorry, I forgot. Okay. Yes, all right. Okay. Uh, Sorry. So regarding the investigation, we have bone marrow aspirate and also trifan biopsy. Uh, and you said uh, we usually, for this uh, case, we'll usually do bone marrow aspirate. For uh, trifan biopsy, it is more accurate, but do we rarely do it because there's less like chance to do it or like less availability? You do it the same procedure. Yeah, it's the same thing. So, uh, hang on, let me get a pen. Have you seen bone marrow aspiration being done before? So this is like the needle, bone marrow needle. So you go in, you go into the skin and then when it touch the bone, and then you remove the stylet. Yeah, you remove the stylet, that means the needle, it become hollow. When you first do it, you must hold the stylet itself, and then after that muscle, you remove the, 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 the one, the stylet, and then you push it. You push it, it goes through the bone marrow. So when you push it, that means, because it is sharp around the edge there, that means it will take the core 
it goes through the core of the bone of the cortex and then until it reaches the marrow. So when it reaches the marrow, you can feel that there is a gift. Suddenly, and then suddenly you feel soft. And then when you do that, and then you twist it a little bit so that the core will be cut off. So you take it, you pull it, and then you take the stylet, you push the stylet, and then the core of the bone will come out. Yeah? And then after that, you aspirate. Yeah, you put in again and you aspirate. So basically, that's what you do. So it's the same procedure. Yeah. So, but you do it in two places. Lah. You do one, you do, uh, you can aspirate first or you can do trephine first. Usually, you do one with the stylet and then it goes to the marrow, you remove the stylet and then you do the suction. And then after that, you take it out a little bit and then you go in again at another different side, you corner the skin curve, and then you push without the stylet. So when you push without the stylet, this edge there will cut through the bone until it reaches the marrow. So that means the core of the bone is inside that already, some like us do. And then you twist it so that it will be disconnected, then you come out and then you will see that core of marrow. So it is done at the same procedure. You do bone marrow aspirate, they shampoo the and all that, so you don't see the architecture. But when you do the tefan, you see the architecture because you take the whole core. So you can assess the fatty infiltration much better, the percentage of fat. Because the severity will depend on how many percent fat infiltration, fat cells in the bone marrow. Yeah? So much of this one, where you can see the cortex of the bone and that, this is a, a trephine biopsy. Where you don't see cortex, this is, I think it's trephine because you can see the cortex, yeah? the pale one, that's a cortex. Because when you do aspiration, you won't see the cortex. So this is trephine in both healthy marrow and as So you can see the fat cells much better because the architecture is maintained. The architecture, the structure of the bone is maintained. Whereas bone marrow is just mixed, like a blood. Yeah? Have you seen bone marrow specimen, bone marrow aspiration? Just like blood, it's just young blood. Yeah, you can assess the blast and all that, but you don't see the architecture. You don't see how much fat cell, how many percent fat cells. So, in get the marrow. Sometimes we call it dry tap. You split it the croix, the croix. Then you have to do trephine. You see the infiltration of the blood cell in the trephine. The disadvantage of trephine in leukemia is that you cannot assess the percentage of the blast. Yeah? Because it mixed with other cells as well. So for you to uh, assess the percentage of blast, you have to do bone marrow aspiration. So, so we because, usually because just do is, both. Yeah? So Sorry. we usually just do both. Usually just uh, done both routinely, whether it is leukemia or aplastic anemia. But aplastic anemia, trephine is more important. In leukemia, bone marrow aspiration is more important. Yeah? You cannot diagnose aplastic anemia without doing the trephine. Understood. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Any other questions? Right there. Okay. Next speaker. So is the end very good timing? Half an hour earlier. That is because I don't interfere that much because everything is quite straightforward in the plastic area. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you guys see my slide? Yes, thank you. Okay. My name is Mama Afi Ben Azmi and I will be presenting the thalassemia, which is the third presentation for today. How many presenters are there today? Oh, five or six? Uh, five. So you're the third person, thalassemia, and the fourth person, you're going to talk on what? 
G6PD. 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 Okay. And the last one? And the last one. Uh, I, ITP. ITP. Okay, ITP is not an uh, enemy of your problem. Kenapa campur ada pula? Okay lah. Okay, this is my table of content, which is the definition, and then the epidemiology, the type of thalassemia, and pathogenesis, the classification, clinical manifestation, complication, investigation, and lastly, the management. First is the definition. Thalassemia is refers to a group of genetic disorders of globin chain production, in which there is an imbalance between alpha globin and beta globin chain production. Uh, as we can see here, uh, there are four alpha genes and there are two beta genes. And this will um, produce uh, alpha 2 and beta 2, for example. And the uh, alpha genes, usually it, it is at, at chromosome 16 and beta genes is at chromosome 11. Uh, it is an autosomal recessive disorder. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, can you go back? Okay, so you must specify that this is genetic disorders of the beta globin or alpha globin chain production. And we, cho we cause imbalance, yeah? Because there are many other types. There is delta, delta thalassemia also. That which is very rare. So in delta thalassemia, you don't get this so much alpha beta gene uh, uh, globin chain production, yeah? So that's why you have to mention that it is alpha, that the commonest type is affect the alpha and beta globin chain production resulting in balance. Okay. Huh? Okay. okay. Thank you. Paul. And next is the autosomal. It is an autosomal recessive disorder, uh, which is uh, we can see if uh, one parent, like father, there is a 50% chance to get a carrier. If uh, both are carriers, then uh, one of the child, one of the four will have thalassemia and the other two will become a carrier. And then if the mother or father is thalassemic and the other one is a carrier, the chance are 50 and 50. And lastly, uh, this one should be read both. It is uh, 100%. Okay. 100% what? To get uh, the thalassemia. To get thalassemia, that means both both are uh, thalassemia. Yes. Okay. Are they Or simple uh, uh, Currently, I think there is a screening right before marriage for thalassemia. Because so, usually thalassemic uh, infertile. Okay. They undergo bone marrow transplant. They become infertile. They go, uh, they do uh, uh, blood transfusion. They get hemosidiosis, they can become infertile as well, even with uh, chelation. So higher chances of infertility, especially in males. Yeah. So the possibility is that they may not get any children. Yeah. So that is a very rare situation. Uh, to mm -hmm. thalassemic marry another thalassemic. Okay. okay. Thank you, bro. Okay. Next is the epidemiology. Uh, thalassemia affects around 7% of the world population, but it is as high as 10% in the Africa, Southeast Asia, and Mediterranean combined. And in Malaysia, we have around 150 to 350 babies are born with thalassemia each year. And this is from the NH, NH uh, National Health, uh, around 4,500 uh, registered thalassemia patients in uh, 2009 August and Sabah has the most registered patient and mainly uh, thalassemia patient affects Malays and Chinese um, in Malaysia. And why, is it, why is it high in Sabah? Uh, I think due to indigenous people there. So indigenous people are high incidence, why? I think the theory is because uh, these thalassemia red blood cells and all that protect the patient from getting malaria. Yeah, because the cells are small and all that, and somehow uh, malaria parasite cannot infect the red blood cells of the uh, thalassemic patient. 
so when they cannot infect, the patient, that means the, the survival is higher, no death due to, uh, due to malaria. And malaria is common in Sabah, in Sarawak, yeah? malaria is common. So when the thalassemic patients are protected, that means the incidence of thalassemia will be much higher. Yeah? More carriers will be alive. More carriers will marry other carriers. And so there is increased incidence of thalassemia. That's uh, one of the theory. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. And next is the beta thalassemia, around five, three to five percent have carrier rate and mostly unaware. And alpha thalassemia is around two percent to seven point five percent carrier rate. And next, uh, we'll go for the first thalassemia, which is the alpha thalassemia. It means that it has daughter absent or reduced amount of alpha globin synthesis. Uh, it is due to the deletion of alpha globin chain gene on chromosome 16. There are four copies of alpha genes, two on each chromosome in normal people. But uh, for thalassemic patient, the pathogenesis, uh, when there is a deletion, uh, either one or two, uh, we can see here, there is one deletion and this is two deletion. Uh, the symptoms might be uh, uh, low, low, presented with low symptom or normal due to the, the hemoglobin is produced uh, normocytic and also uh, you, if, uh, even if two alpha genes deleted, it becomes alpha thalassemic trait. Um, it is a microcytic target with target cell and it can have anemia or not. Um, you all understand this uh, diagram or not? Because this is very important. Okay. You see that, uh, that like the uh, railway line there, eh? yeah? So the one, the figure on the left, this is normal, right? Because there are the four genes, normal. So this is on chromosome 16. Each chromosome have two alleles. So one allele and another one. So each of them have normal number of uh, alpha gene. And then this patient at the top there on the right side, have one gene deletion on one of the allele. So this is called, what do you call this? This is not normal, right? This is called a silent carrier. Why is it called silent carrier? Because everything is normal, yeah? So usually it is uh, normal, hemoglobin is normal, and uh, usually it is normocytic. Uh, anemia. So to make this diagnosis, you have to do DNA analysis. Yeah? And this one is two gene deletion. Two gene deletion can be one each uh, is deleted on each of the allele, or one allele is normal, but in the other allele, both genes are deleted. So this is two gene deletion. This is called alpha thalassemia 3. Right? And then we have uh, slight uh, anemia, and they have hypochromic microcytic anemia. Okay, understand. Okay, next. Uh, next one is uh, when there are three alpha genes deleted, it is called as hemoglobin H disease. Uh, the pathogenesis is when uh, there is a three deletion, there will be excess of beta globin chain, and this beta globin chain. Will, will form the beta of the tramus, which is the hemoglobin H. Uh, it is a uh, hemoglobin H damage to the membrane, which cause chronic hemolytic anemia. And the hemoglobin H has no intramedullary destruction because it is soluble and don't precipitate on the precursors. But it precipitates on the old RBC, and then it is caused it cause extravascular hemolysis. Uh, for HBH disease, there are still low amount of hemoglobin, normal uh, amount, but it is microcytic and there are target cell. Okay. okay, so this is very important. This is the alpha thalassemia that is problematic. Okay, because the single gene deletion, silent carrier, no problem. It can just transmit uh, to the offspring. And then the trait also, no problem. They are not anemic and all that, they just can transmit. But HBH disease, okay, these are the ones that's living 
and sometimes require transfusion. Yeah, so you understand three genes are deleted, only one is left. Two is deleted on one allele and the other one is deleted on the same allele, so only one gene. So because of that, the alpha globin chain is reduced. So when there's alpha globin chain, alpha is supposed to combine with beta. They're supposed to have almost equal production. So when there is decrease in alpha, then there is excess in beta. When there's excess in beta, then beta combines with beta. So that's why you get this beta four tetramers. Yeah, at the bottom there. Sapani uh, Afid, can you show it? Yeah, at the bottom there, beta, all the four beta, they combine instead of combining alpha. So this is the HBH. This is called HBH, which is made of beta four. Yeah, and this one presented on RBCs and cause hemolysis. But it is not as bad as beta thalassemia major or beta thalassemia intermediate because it does not cause intramedullary destruction. So there is no increase in, uh, there is no intramedullary, what do you call it, erythropoiesis. No, there, no ineffective erythropoiesis. Ineffective erythropoiesis is disturbance in the erythropoiesis because of precipitation of excess alpha chain in the young RBCs in the bone marrow. So it occurs only in beta thalassemia. In alpha thalassemia, the HBH is soluble, does not precipitate on the precursors in the erythrocytes, erythroblasts in the bone marrow. So they don't have ineffective erythropoiesis. So the anemia is not as severe as, so it's usually not thalassemia major, but it is a form of thalassemia intermediate. Okay? Understand? Makes sense. Understand? Kalau tak understand, kita berhenti kat sini. Sampai setengah jam, sampai you all understand. Anybody don't understand? Anybody understand? Zul, understand? Faham? Understand, Dr. Ah, uh, faham. Okay, jawablah kalau faham. Diam je. Wasting time, faham. right? Okay, Zul, uh, faham je dah. Kita boleh continue. Seorang je nak faham boleh continue. Because that one person can explain to the others later on. As long as at least one person understand. All right. Okay, next is uh, hemoglobin Barth's disease. This is due to four alpha genes has been deleted. Uh, the pathogenesis will cause uh, no hemoglobin F. Uh, hemoglobin F is predominant in the fetal life, especially below six months old, which consists of alpha 2 and uh, gamma 2 produce. Uh, it, uh, this four alpha gene deletion will finally form uh, gamma tetramers, which is the hemoglobin parts, and 20% is hemoglobin portlands. Uh, hemoglobin parts have high oxygen affinity, which uh, reduce uh, tissue hypoxia, and also intrauterine anemia for the fetus. And finally, the fetus will have hydrophytalis, which is a fatal condition. Okay, as we can see here, uh, due to poor oxygen release uh, and no alpha uh, genes, uh, the, there will be no conversion of hemoglobin F to uh, hemoglobin A, A2 for, uh, for us. And this is the picture. Yeah, okay, go back. Yeah. So this is a very important diagram here. Yeah. Alpha chain, alpha chain, right from the beginning, must be there. Constant. Beta chain, only after about three months. And six months, it is almost 100%. So that's why after about six months, alpha and beta, the same. Yeah, so they can combine together. Right? In HBH disease, it doesn't occur, doesn't start from the entire trend, okay? Because there is some alpha chain. So there is, uh, in HBH disease, only after the baby was born and all that, when the beta start to be produced, then you get excess of beta chain, then you get beta tetramers. 
But in the intrauterine lice, you don't get beta tetramers because there's no beta chain yet. Normally, the beta chain start to be produced only after birth. It's only gamma. So in the intrauterine lice, if you look at the left side, uh, then can you show, Afik, can you uh, show the, yeah, on the left side, so uh, alpha tether, so there's no choice, but the gamma have to be combined together. Cannot combine with other thing. So this is called bud, hemoglobin bud. And hemoglobin bud have high affinity for oxygen. What does that mean? That means it will keep all the oxygen to itself, does not release the oxygen to the cells. So this can cause severe tissue asphyxia, intrauterine anemia, and can cause death, intrauterine death. So that's why, like I said, HBA, uh, uh, tel uh, alpha thalassemia, you see only HBA disease as problematic. Because silent carrier, no problem. Alpha thalassemia trait, no problem. And then uh, HB bugs, which is all the four genes are deleted, no problem as well because they have intrauterine death or they die soon after birth. Right? So the alpha thalassemia that you see coming to the hospital, uh, HB disease. Understand? This will die soon after birth or in trauterine life. Unless you're living in US or in uh, UK or what, you can give in transfusion. You can give transfusion, blood transfusion to the baby. And then the baby is born alive. And then after the baby is born alive, you can continue with the blood transfusion, just like in transfusion dependent thalassemia, just like in beta thalassemia, you give monthly transfusion or three, three weekly transfusion. But you need to keep the patient alive in triatrine by giving triatrine transfusion, which is not available in this country. Okay, understand? Okay. Okay, boleh jalan. Okay. Uh, this is the condition called hydroxvitalis, which is the accumulation of bleed usually in the liver and severe abdominal swelling. Okay. Uh, next is the summary, the classification. The silent carrier is uh, F1, uh, the minor or, or the carrier F2, deletion, hemoglobin H has three, and so on. For so the, the last next one next is step. not compatible with life. The first two is uh, usually asymptomatic, malinemia, and this is the one which come to the hospital, yeah? Uh, Yes. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and this is uh, the uh, the uh, adult uh, form, which is HB, HBA, brown ninety percent, HBF less than two percent, A two to two to five percent, and HBA one C. Okay. This is the normal hemoglobin component in normal people. Yeah. When you do HB electrophoresis, this is what you see. HbA1c comes out together with HbA. So usually you don't get, when you do HbA autoposis, this does not come out differently, HbA1c. You get HbA, HbF, and HbA2. So in thalassemia, there is no abnormal hemoglobin, only the proportion of the hemoglobin A, hemoglobin F, hemoglobin A2 are different. Yeah. Okay. Next, uh, move on with the beta thalassemia. Uh, it, it means uh, it has total absence of beta, uh, total absence in beta naught or beta globin synthesis or reduced amount, beta plus. A patient can inherit two beta globin mutation, one from each parent, which is the point mutation on chromosome 11. The beta thalassemia, the pathogenesis is the point mutation at chromosome 11 like here, either one or two, and then it causes reduction or absence of globin chain. And then this causes excess of alpha globin, which causes unstable and precipitate. And it causes intramedullary destruction and ineffective erythropoiesis. But the escape RBC, they have the alpha precipitates, also have hemolysis, but it is extravascular. Uh, as we can see here, reduce or no HBA depending on the thalassemic mutation 
which cause microcytosis. And then the big excess of alpha chain, it will apoptosis in intravascular. And it, it causes severe reduce in production of anemia. But the survival or untransfused dependent on HBF. And then hemoglobin A2 percentage is above normal, but not enough to live on. So this is a very good uh, slide that all of you should know, right? The pathogenesis is very important. The main problem is because of excess alpha. Yeah, just like uh, excess female in certain countries. So they cannot uh, combine, cannot get married. So excess alpha, alpha, not enough beta for them to combine with. And this can precipitate in the young RBCs, in the erythrocytes, erythroblasts, in the bone marrow cause ineffective erythropoiesis. They are destroyed right in the bone marrow or some okay, of the RBCs and all that can come out of the bone marrow but uh, the uh, precipitate, the alpha gene, alpha chain that precipitate in the red blood cell cause hemolysis in the split, extra uh, hemolysis. You have shortened red blood cell survival because of the alpha precipitate. And like you might mention just now, there is beta plus, beta zero. Beta plus or beta naught. So if this patient homozygous, can you point, uh, uh, Afik? The red one there, beta, beta there. If both of them are beta plus, beta plus, then there is some beta chain. If there is both of them is beta zero or beta naught, beta naught, there is no alpha chain at all. So the HBA will be zero. So if it is beta plus, beta plus homozygous, there is some HBA. And then you can get a combination of beta naught and beta plus. So on one allele it is beta plus and the other one is beta naught you may have some alpha, uh, some beta chain as well. So the most severe one is the homozygous beta naught. The second uh, severe one is the double heterozygous. It is not just heterozygous, it's double, but it's different. It's not homozygous because one is beta naught, one is beta plus. Double heterozygous, beta naught, beta plus, that is less severe than homozygous beta naught. And then the less severe of the homozygous is the homozygous beta plus, both beta plus, beta plus. Because there is more beta chain than in homozygous beta naught and more beta chain than homozygous and then double heterozygous beta naught, beta plus. Understand? Yes. Kapoor. Presenter. Oh, presenter, so I understand. I'm going to understand. Understand, doctor. Okay, number 10. Okay, very good. Okay. Next. Okay. okay. This is the graphical uh, pathophysiology. Um, as the doctor has mentioned, Prof. mentioned before, uh, due to this is the normal, but the beta one, it, it has insoluble alpha globin aggregate and it has abnormal erythroblast. So the bone marrow will uh, try to compensate by making uh, more ineffective erythropoiesis, but die in bone marrow. But few can uh, survive, but it will die extravascularly. So both this condition leads to anemia. And this causes tissue anoxia, and erythropoietin will be increased. Finally, this causes uh, marrow expansion to compensate uh, more in, uh, due to an anemic feature, and we can see this later. Okay, this is the classification. The beta thalassemia major, also called a schoolies anemia, it has uh, either beta not, beta not, or beta not, beta plus. And the anemic state is very severe. It need, it need, the patient needs transfusion monthly and very symptomatic. The hemoglobin level might be lower than five and the hemoglobin F is, is severely high. Next is beta thalassemia intermedia. It has either beta naught, beta plus, or beta plus, beta plus. It is a moderate anemia or intermedia. And late onset, transmission need to be done three to four uh, monthly. Hemoglobin level is at uh, moderate level. 
And next one is thalass beta thalassemia minor or trait or silent carrier trait. It has either beta beta not or beta beta plus. It is mild or asymptomatic and does not require transfusion. And golden liver is slightly uh, slightly anemic. Okay, this is another chart for you to understand. Yeah. So like I said just now, this is homozygous beta not. This one will have no HBE at all. But double heterozygous beta not and beta plus, there may be some HBA. So what you show hemoglobin level there, H, HBA to HBF and all that, this is more for homozygous beta not. Yeah. In H, uh, in beta plus, there is some. So why is that beta not, beta plus, some is uh, severe, some, you see the other row there, beta not, beta plus is moderate anemia. Why? because it's not the same mutation. Yeah? There are many types of mutation of beta plus. So some mutation is severe, some mutation is not as severe. So if there's severe mutation, severe beta plus mutation, then beta plus jumper beta not, then it is very severe. If less severe mutation, beta plus beta not, then moderate anemia. In fact, if both are severe mutation, yeah, beta plus, beta plus. This can go up there as well, can have severe thalassemia as well. So there are various mutations. I think uh, up to uh, more than uh, three dozen type of mutation in the beta thalassemia. So some mutations are much more severe than others. Okay. Uh, next is uh, clinical manifestation. Uh, the patient might have features of anemia, such as failure, lethargic dyspnea, cardiac enlargement, and also failure to thrive. Next is features due to hemolysis, which is jaundice, and features due to intramedullary erythropoiesis, which is characterized with thalassemic phases or cheek mount. Uh, the patient have like frontal bossing, frontal bossing and then maxillary enlargement, and then flat nasal bridge, you can see here, and then misalignment of the teeth. Okay. The patient might also- So have this is very important, yeah? So there is increase in intramedullary erythropoiesis because you saw just now erythropoietin because of uh, apoxia, there is feedback mechanism, erythropoietin is increased. So the factory will be uh, open to make more red blood cells. Even though it is effective, because of increased erythropoiesis, more factories are open. And these are factories bone marrow in the flat bones. Usually erythropoiesis is in the long bones, at the end of long bones. But when there is increase in erythropoiesis, even the flat bones are becoming active as well. That's why you have all these features. Hyperplasia of the flat bone, yeah, in the frontal and in the maxillary. And you may have extra medullary outside the bone marrow erythropoiesis as well. That's why you have hepatosplenomegaly. Okay, next. Okay, next is features. Extra yes. Extra medullary hemopoiesis. You can see here uh, splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. And then the features due to iron overload, such as abdominal pain, brown skin, endocrinopathies, such as lip puberty, amenorrhea, and cardiovascular problems. This iron overload is due to uh, increase in iron iron absorption in the stomach to compensate for more erythropoiesis. But most important feature, most important uh, factor is because of the blood transfusion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, not just because of the adoption of the but because of the uh, transfusion. And extra medullary hemopoiesis, that means production of the red blood cells outside the bone marrow. So this is outside the bone marrow. Yeah? In the liver and in the spleen. Okay. <coughs> Next is the complications. Uh, iron overload due to increased iron absorption and also repeated blood transfusion. And next is the blood transfusion complications such as uh, antibody formation, infections such as uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis B, and then fluid overload, hypothermia, and electrolytes imbalance. 
Okay, this is uh, the organs that may be affected if there is an iron overload. It can cause uh, pituitary gland uh, abnormalities, thyroid, heart, adrenal gland, liver, pancreas, ovary, and testes. Next is uh, investigation. Uh, we should do a full blood count and full blood picture to find any abnormalities such as hypochromic or micro and macrocytic anemia with uh, reduced MCH and MCB. And then full blood picture, we can see moderate to severe and isopoikilocytosis. There are target cells, esophilic stippling, and also nucleated RBC. For liver function tests, uh, we, we can check for hyperbilirubinemia if there is, and then serum ferritin can be elevated. And next is for diagnostic testing, uh, hemoglobin analysis, either by electrophoresis or HPLC. HPLC stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography, uh, which is in the next slide later. Uh, for beta thalassemia major, we can see the HBA will be decreased, HBF increase, and HBA2 is variable. For so HBA can be absent or decreased. Yeah, must mention that. And you cannot say serum ferritin can be elevated. Serum ferritin will be elevated in all patients with uh, thalassemia, beta thalassemia, especially thalassemia major. These are the normal or elevated. Once they are transfused, uh, transfused then be elevated. Okay. Uh, next is DNA analysis. Is not routinely performed, but uh, uh, it may be done to indicate inability to confirm hemoglobinopathy and also for genetic counseling or prenatal screening. For example, chorionic video sampling and immunosynthesis. Lastly, is for RBC smear to detect hemoglobin H inclusion. Okay, these are the pictures. Uh, can you go, okay. go back there? Uh. Okay. Okay, prenatal screening, for example, chorionic various sampling, amniocentesis. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Uh, I, I think to uh, detect uh, early for the child. If the yeah, that's not screen. That is not screening. That's prenatal diagnosis. Yeah, because uh, when you do chorionic uh, villa sampling. You are making the diagnosis already. Screening, you know what is meant by screening? Screening is a simple test that is routinely done in a certain group of population. Right? For example, you screen for G6PD. It is routinely done in all newborn. And it is easy test. You do just blood tests. Coronary uh, villa sampling is not an easy test. Amniocentesis is not an easy test. It can cause abortion, spontaneous abortion, fetal wastage. Yeah, so it doesn't uh, fulfill the criteria of screening. And when you say screening, you do it on a certain selected population. So if you say, okay, I'm going to do chorionic villa sampling in all pregnant women who are carriers, uh, then it can, can be called screening. It fulfills half of the screening. Because you see, you're going to do on this selected population. So this is antenatal diagnosis because it is a very sophisticated, dangerous technique, and it is done on special request by the parents. It's not screening. You don't say everybody. We say the other, another the thalassemia. Okay, let's do amniocentesis in all of them, in all the mothers who have uh, who have already thalassemia. No. Only after discussion and the parents agree, the parents want it, then you do it. And that's antenatal diagnosis. It confirms the diagnosis. Okay? You must understand the term screening. Pam, Afik. Okay, Pam, Pam. Yeah, all, all the others understand as well. Yeah? Mm. All right, okay. Okay. Uh, next is the investigation uh, results, such as in full blood count. We can see uh, the RBC is uh, can be a uh, uh, hypochromic microcity, and then there is uh, so you either. You can see that it is almost the same as in IU deficiency, right? 
You can see mm -hmm. endocytosis, poikilocytosis, you can see target cells, you can see cancer cells, you can see hypochromasia. Yeah? So this is one important differential diagnosis of patient with, uh, you are shown in the exam, for example, you are shown this blood film, they will ask you, describe the blood film, and then you have to describe the abnormalities. And they say, give two differential diagnoses that you have to give, thalassemia as well as eye emergency. Okay. Okay. And this is for the hemoglobin uh, studies. Uh, we can see if there is uh, if there is treat. We can see the anomaly is here, and then the major increase in hemoglobin F, sickle cell treat can be a hemoglobin S, and then sickle cell anemia. So nobody will go about sickle cell. We are talking about the thalassemia. So in thalassemia, like I told you, the top three column is important. Yeah, you don't see any abnormal hemoglobin, but you see different proportion of hemoglobin. Thalassemia major, HBF is bigger. You see the blue, big blue line. Yeah, thalassemia trait. Okay, the HBF is very uh, narrow. But compared to the normal, the HBA2 is bigger, so that. Blue line. So it's the same type of hemoglobin which is found in normal adult, but different proportion. Whereas in other hemoglobin properties, for example, HBE, HBC, uh, HBC disease, HBE disease, sickle cell disease, you have an abnormal hemoglobin. So remember, in thalassemia, you don't have abnormal hemoglobin, but you have abnormal proportion. Only alpha thalassemia is different because you have HBH, which is a different hemoglobin. It's not compared to HBA, HBF, HBA, HBA2. Alpha thalassemia, you have an abnormal hemoglobin with this HBH. Okay, Papa, you can move on. Okay. And this one is for HPLC. Yeah. It is uh, more like graph. HPLC is much more detailed. You can HBA1C as well. Yeah. So usually you do HBL to first C and all that. Then you don't see HPA1C. That's why I said just now you don't see it. So what about the other slide, the blue one? Though? Uh, I think this is the nucleated RBC. Okay. Right. okay. Next is uh, another investigation is such as imaging studies. So we may have okay. to do plain radiograph. So okay. That's not done routinely, right? Unless uh, not, not it's a suspected for problem. Mm -hmm. But we can see if there is any like growth in the bone, and then uh, MRI to measure iron deposition. Uh, this is red cell phenotyping. So this is special MRI, okay? This is called MR MRI T2 star. And this is done for the heart and as well as for the liver to assess whether there's any iron overload in the heart or not, whether there's any iron overload in the liver. Not all hospitals have facilities for this MRI T2 star. So this is very useful, yeah? Because complication of iron overload, you can get liver cirrhosis, and the fatal complication is you can get cardiomyopathy. So in big hospital, you do MRI T2 star yearly in transfusion-dependent patients. Okay. okay. Okay, next is the red cell phenotyping for blood group grouping and then infection screening, if there is any infection for, especially for blood transfusion, and then HLA typing for uh, bone marrow transplantation. Okay, so this is called screening, okay? Because you will do it all patient. You will do this every six months, yeah? Because all these uh, can be transfusion, uh, can be uh, blood transfusion, and transmitted to blood, blood transmitted disease. Patient receive blood transfusion every month, and so every six months you have to check. Yeah, for hepatitis, for uh, HIV. Okay. okay. Next for management, uh, for blood transfusion is indicated for beta thalassemia major. Uh, when to start is when there is a confirmed diagnosis, and hemoglobin is less than seven on two occasions and two weeks apart with no infection. 
the aim is to maintain the hemoglobin at least for 9 to 10. And the post-transfusion mean hemoglobin is uh, above uh, 13 to 15. And the mean is at 12 to 12 to 5. Interval is monthly and then the volume. And then next. So, uh, so you don't call it the aim, it's the transfusion target. Okay. Target of transfusion. The aim of transfusion, number one is to switch off erythropoiesis. So that all the blood is important blood, not made by the patient. Yeah. So a patient who is well transfused, you don't get hepatitis splenomegaly because this hemopoiesis is switched off. So they don't have extra medullary erythropoiesis. There is no frontal bossing, there's no thalassemic phases. Again, because the transfusion, because the hemopoiesis is switched off. All the blood come from outside, all important blood. If Malaysia import paddy from uh, Thailand, there's nothing more, more for paddy fields, all important. So all the paddy field play about twin towers all over the world, all over Malaysia. Yeah, so this is that is the aim of transfusion to switch off the hemopoiesis and to enable the patient to have normal growth and normal activity. Because with patient with chronic hypoxia, the patient will not grow well. And the patient with chronic hypoxia also, chronic anemia will not have normal activity. So the aim of transfusion is to provide normal growth, normal activity, and to switch off the patient's hemopoiesis. And the target of uh, transfusion is transfusion, yeah, to maintain the hemoglobin between 13.5 to 15.5 post transfusion, and never let the blood level goes below nine. Because it goes below nine, then the body will start its own hemopoiesis. Then the liver can get bigger, the spleen can get bigger. Patient may have thalassemic phases. <coughs> okay. Next for thalassemia intermediate, uh, when to start is when clinical diagnosis at more than two years old with symptoms of hemoglobin eight or below. And then hemoglobin H uh, only transfuse if hemoglobin is less than seven or severe and or sym symptomatic. <coughs> okay. Next is the diet and the supplement for thalassemic patient. Okay, with, this one thalassemia intermediate when to start clinical diagnosis at two years old. If the diagnosis is less than two years old, then they are thalassemia major. Okay, thalassemia major, transfusion dependent thalassemia, usually diagnosed at very young age, around six months, one year old, and usually less than one year old. If they are diagnosed more than two years old. So actually the, the one at that is not when to start. When you diagnose thalassemia intermediate, you diagnose, usually when the, uh, the diagnosis is made after two years old, and when the hemoglobin is maintained, can be maintained around age seven and that, the hemoglobin will not fall down. They will fall, they will fall below eight only intermittently when they have infection, when they're unwell, then hemoglobin goes below seven. And that's when you give transfusion. So thalassemia intermediate by definition is non-transfusion dependent. You give transfusion, only when the hemoglobin goes below seven. Yeah? And usually these patients are diagnosed after two years old because they are not severe, so they present late. But you give them regular transmission, you convert them into transition dependent. If they start to have big liver, big spleen, if they are short stature, they're not growing very well. If they start to develop thalassemic phases, which the parents find unacceptable, they have a beautiful girl and then a beautiful daughter and suddenly have frontal bossing, have got maxillary prominence and all that, then you can start giving regular transfusion so that you switch off the erythropoiesis. So that there won't be intramedullary erythropoiesis. There won't be expansion of the flat bone. There won't be big liver, big spleen, you switch off. Okay, understand? So thalassemia intermediate, non transfusion dependent, usually diagnosed late, Usually you need to give hemoglobin get to give uh, a transmission when the hemoglobin goes down to less than seven. It's intermittently, maybe every three months, or every four months. But for them to maintain hemoglobin of eight or nine or above seven, they have to have 
extramedullary erythropoiesis and intramedullary erythropoiesis, which can cause them to be dysmorphic, which can cause abnormal distension, and they may have chronic hypoxia. So when that happens, uh, you follow the growth chart and all that, you see, you check the liver spleen and getting bigger and bigger, you say, okay, this kind of mother, okay, this is going to get worse, the liver is going to get bigger, the face is going to be more uh, ugly. Let's start giving regular transfusion. Yeah? So you're converting the patient from thalassemia media, intermedia into thalassemia major. Adam Hub. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, for diet and supplement, we give oral folate and vitamin E. Uh, for I think I I read it for uh, uh, healing purpose, and then for to avoid iron rich food to prevent iron overload. For healing purpose, what do you mean for healing purpose? Uh, for the elect function. Which one? To give what for healing? Uh, vitamin E. Vitamin E. I'm not sure, but I think the theory is that it uh, stabilizes the red blood cells. So the hemolysis is, uh, is much more resistant to hemo hemolysis. Yeah? But it is not used routinely yeah? because uh, it is just a theory. Yeah? It can prolong the, the RBC span uh, slightly only. Folate, usually, it is not needed if you are trans. Uh, if you are importing all the blood from outside, you don't need folate. Yeah? Because folate is one of the raw materials for hemopoiesis, isn't it? If you switch off the hemopoiesis, the, baby, uh, the patient is not uh, doing hemopoiesis anymore. There's no need for raw material. Understand? If the baby is not cooking anymore to produce red blood cells, so they don't need all this folate, they don't need uh, sayo, they don't need ketchup and all that. Yeah? But it is still given routinely, but it is really not necessary if patient is getting adequate transfusion. Right? Okay, ada lagi? Berapa slide lagi? Banyak, banyak lagi? Sikit lagi. Sikit berapa? Tengah, banyak? I think around five slides lagi. Okay, alright. Okay. Next is the iron chelation therapy, which is desferioxamine. Uh, 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 for to avoid uh, ion overload, we mean the target is to maintain. Okay, I think uh, okay, it is uh, four fifty now. Otherwise, uh, we cannot finish. So basically, two mainstay of treatment. One is blood transfusion, regular transfusion, regular safe, adequate blood transfusion, and the other mainstay of treatment is ion chelation to provide to uh, avoid ion overload because. This is the one that can cause fatality. So I think this is uh, too much detail. You can just pass the slide to all of them. Boleh, yeah? Oh, yes. Okay. So, tidak, nanti kelima pun tak, tak habis, yeah? Basically, okay. there are two ways. One is by uh, infusion, subcutaneous infusion, desfoxamine. This is the old method, established method, but this is cumbersome. Uh, difficult, you have to give uh, every night and then by injection. So now they are changing to oral. Oral, there are two types one is defrofrox and the other one is desferfrox. Desferfrox is better, less side effect, and can be used in younger patients from two years old. This one, you cannot use in very young patients, defrofrox, and have more side effect. So among the oral, desferfrox is recommended. Sometimes you have to use combined desferoxamine, subcutaneous, plus oral. If, for example, if the serum ferritin is not coming down, if patient has got cardiomyopathy due to iron overload, then you want to give aggressive treatment, you have to give both combination. So if you want to give a single one, young child, you give desferoxamine. And then if inadequate, inadequate relation, even though adequate dose and all that still high, you combine with just functioning. Okay, next. 
Next is uh, splenectomy. Splenectomy is, is not uh, common nowadays because splenectomy is done in patients with hypersplenism, big spleen, and that's not common nowadays because there is because you give adequate transfusion, so you don't get extra medullary erythropoiesis. You don't get extra medullary erythropoiesis. You don't get big spleen. So most of thalassemia nowadays, the spleen is not big or just palpable only, and does not cause hypersplenism. Bone marrow transplant is the only curative treatment. And in Malaysia, there are two centers which can do bone marrow transplant. So this should be offered to the patient. If they refuse bone marrow transplant, then only you opt for transfusion and chelation. OK? OK. Really? Uh, the last uh, reference. Okay, uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Other than we can proceed two more, and it is already 4 to 20. Who's the next speaker? Let me go to the Wait, toilet for a while. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Boleh? Boleh, boleh. Nanti kan, second channel seluar nanti. Sedap. Okay, Al Hakim bin yes, Isnan. Yeah. Where are you from, Al Hakim? I'm from Klang, Selangor. Klang. Oh. Yeah. So, are you in Klang now or in Kuantan? In Klang. Oh, so all of you are from home last morning, yes. not in Kuantan. No. Oh, I see. Bagus, huh? All right. Hello, okay. Assalamualaikum. I'm going. Oh. Uh, my name is Mama Al Hakim, and I'm going to present about uh, G6PD. Efficiency. So, how many slides you have? Six slides? Uh, not yet. Uh, but some other disease like uh, hereditospherocytosis and ovalocytosis. I have Close. about 17 slides. 17? 17? 17? Yeah. Yeah. 17? Okay. Okay. So, this is my slide. Okay. First, uh, the epidemiology of G6PD deficiency. It is the common enzyme worldwide and affecting over 400 people, mainly affected. 400 people, affecting over 400, 400 people. million people, sorry. Ah. 400 million people and mainly affect West Africa, Middle East, Mediterranean and Southeast Asia. It is common in Malaysia with incidence, overall incidence of 3.1 among males and is more prevalent in Malays and Chinese but less common in India. And it is acting recessive and mostly male are affected, but female may be affected, but most of them become a carrier. It is rare for them to be having this deficient. And the mutation is on gene locus XQ28, a point mutation amino acid substitution, and it is believed 
that it is protective against Plasmodium falciparum. Not, not completely, but partial, partial. Uh, so, people in country like endemic malaria, so some of them will be protected from malaria. Okay, next is in yeah, the prevalence. So, so it is not completely protected. Do you know yeah. how G6PD was first discovered? Uh, no, not that thing. It was first discovered in Panama. When they opened the Panama Canal and all that, they get a lot of workers into the jungle to dig the canal. So many of them get malaria, a fever, and then the doctors send there and they found out these people have malaria. So all of them were given quinine. Yeah, and quinine is one of the drugs that can cause G6PD, hemolysis. yeah, hemolysis. So they found that all of them are having hemolysis, having uh, dark colored urine, jaundice, and all that. And all they found, oh, G6PD, the discovery of G6PD. Kalau tak silap saya lah. Kalau saya silap, jadi mana cerita dongeng lah. But I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. The, the next slide is the distribution of the prevalence of G6PD in Malaysia. So, mostly affect males and high in Malay and Chinese, but less in Indians. Okay. So, ni kenapa different colors map ni? Different, different incidents, is it? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Different uh, negeri, states. Uh. So you mean different incidents yang ada circle ke apa? Higher incidents? Or... That they, the, they did the study at certain okay. parts of the oh. area. Alright. Alright. Okay, next is the pathophysiology. Okay. So the patient that are like of G6PD, G6PD is the glucose, glucose 6-fulfate dehydrogenase, which it want to produce the NADP to reduce, they to oxidize the NADP into NADPH, which and ADPH is important in our body, which to protect from the free radical damage and protect uh, and to convert oxygen uh, and to what do you say to fight the infection because uh, NADPH needs to reduce the oxygen into oxygen ion, which later we'll use by in neutrophils, and the neutrophils will fight the infection. So the person that does not have G6PD. They will prone to infection. That's why infection is the most common causes of uh, what was it? Of the oxidative stress. Okay. All right. So uh, it is glucose six phosphate transformed into six glucophosphate gluconate. So the NADPH will con will convert the GSS oxidase into glutathione. Then the glutathione will reduce. You know, no, no. The oxidase the H2O2 hydrogen peroxide into water because hydrogen peroxide is the oxidative stressor agent that will affect the hemoglobin. So, and this G6PD is the red limiting enzyme in HMP shunts to mop up free radicals that cause oxidative damage and they are at risk of hemolytic anemia. Okay. Okay, next is the clinical features. Most are asymptomatic but unless they are triggered by the oxidative stressor. So they can have a normal life, but once they've been exposed to the stressor like drugs, uh, fava beans, kacang parang, and the other one is infection. Okay, So the symptom of the person is shortness of breath, weakness, lethargy, weakness, pallor, precipitated by infection, fava beans, and it is intravascular hemolysis. And in in newborns, there is neonatal jaundice, which is co common, which is common for the babies to have jaundice. Yeah, actually, it is a mix. Uh, like it is mixed extravascular and intravascular hemolysis. Oh, it's yeah. Mixed. So if there is severe hemolysis, then it's mainly intra intravascular. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it can be extravascular as well. And uh, there is a certain type of G6PD deficiency because G6PD deficiency also there are many, many mutations, more than a hundred mutations. So different mutations have different severity. So there is one type of, uh, of G6PD deficiency, which is the African type. Right? African type. And uh, they are class one or class two G6PD deficiency. They may have chronic hemolytic anemia, just like thalassemia, but that is not the, the type that is 
uh, present in the Oriental, in Malaysia, and among the Chinese, you know. So among the Malaysian, among the Chinese, among the Oriental, usually they have intermittent hemolysis when it is exposed to a stressor, not chronic hemolytic anemia, like a rare form of uh, G6PD deficiency among the Africans. Okay, right. okay. Uh, this is the drug that will give the stressor to the person, like anti-malaria, like Dr. Sid, Pinit. Chloroquine, empiromaquine, and antibiotics, sulfonamide, phenolone, analgesic aspirin, and some chemicals, naphthalene and davicin. Davicin is from fava beans, kacang parang, and some other isouramil. Okay, next is the investigation. We must do the complete blood I count. I like that. We must, <laughs> must, not we can. Yeah. All right. Oh. So <laughs> we. Yes. Okay, so uh, we must do the complete blood count. And of course, homoglobin level will be low and reticulocyte increase because to compensate with the red blood cell that feel lost. And in the blood film, blood film, there will be bite, blister cells, and Heinz body. Heinz body comes first, then bite cell comes later. Because Heinz body is a part of the RBC, has been oxidized, then macrophage will engulf the oxidized part, leaving the other, other red blood cell. So that's where the bite cell form. Okay, next is the liver function test. Increase unconjugated serum bilirubin. And urinalysis, we have uh, hemoglobinuria and also hemosider, hemosiderinuria. Yeah, because of the rupture of the RBC. Okay, uh, next is the fluorescent spot test. Uh, this fluorescent spot test, uh, Reliable to men, but ah uh, yeah, it's reliable. Not yeah, uh, it's reliable, but and the reliable to men, not reliable, reliable. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Is it reliable or not? Ah yes, it is. Uh, but the most reliable is DNA testing, because we can have a false negative result on fluorescent spot test if we do during the oxidative period. It means the person are being exposed to the Oxidative stressor, and because of the presence of retu, retu, reticulocytosis, which the reticulocytosis have G six PD sufficient for them, so during the state of oxidative stress happen, so the first swab test will fluoresce due to the reticulocytosis. Okay. So you all understand, Anna. So fluorescent spot test is the test that's done for screening of G6PD in newborn. Use this uh, uh, fluorescent, fluorescent test, okay? And uh, it can be used for diagnosis as well, but it is not during the acute hemolysis. Yes. Okay. What happens in acute hemolysis is the cells which are deficient in G6PD, okay? Will be destroyed, will hemolyze. Only red blood cells that have enough G6PD will still remain intact. So when you do this spot test, okay, it will give a false negative. The test is negative because the fluorescent is there, because what you're testing is the testing the red blood cells, the remaining red blood cells, the young red blood cells, the reticulocyte, which have a lot of G6PD, which is normal G6PD. The one that have le uh, less G6PD are the old red blood cells. And when they are exposed to stresses, the old red blood cells like me will die. Young red blood cells like you will not die. And you will have enough G6PD. So when you do uh, a spot test on your blood and all that, then it doesn't show that it's deficient. But DNA testing, whether you do it acute or whether you do it later on, you know, you this, uh, you can get the diagnosis because this does not change. The DNA does not change whether in young uh, cells or in the old cells. Okay. Right. okay? So, that's right. So that's why when you want to do fluorescent test, patient has got acute hemolysis, you have to wait for another two months before you do the test so that the young red blood cells have become older. Right? And if they are G6 pretty deficient, then you can see the fluorescent test will be positive. 
Betul. Uh, Why do they get hemoglobinuria? Because of intravascular hemolysis. So because of intravascular hemolysis, they may have uh, hemoglobinemia as well. You check the blood and you can find hemoglobin in the blood. Yeah, normal people, you find red blood cells in the blood. The hemoglobin is inside the red blood cells. What if there is intravascular hemolysis, the cells break down and release the hemoglobin. So there is hemoglobinemia, hemoglobin in the blood, and this hemoglobin goes out to the urine and cause hemoglobinuria. Right? And the hemoglobinuria become oxidized and all that, they change into hemocidinuria. Hemocidin. Hemocidinuria. Hemocidin. Ada budak nama Sidin sini, tak ada. Nama Sidin over Ya. Yes. Okay. So that's the interesting thing is the definitive diagnosis. Okay, next is uh, this is the picture of the hind's body and this is how the bite size look. Uh, the macrophage will engulf this part only leaving this RBC. So this will be shown on the blood film. Okay. Okay. That can, can come in the exam. If I were to see it, give you exam papers and all that, I will show you. Okay. What's the abnormalities in this blood film? Give the diagnosis. Give the mode of inheritance. But unfortunately, they never asked me to uh, give questions for the exam. If not, I can tell you what question I submit. Okay. 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 Next is the treatment. Uh, the main treatments of G6PD deficiency is to avoid the oxidative stressor because they only present with present onset when they exposed to the stressor. So okay, uh, blood first is blood transfusion if necessary. If the patient is severe, stop the drugs and sulfavabine of course. Uh, treat the underlying infection and phototherapy. Phototherapy is for newborns where the fluorescent light is exposed to the baby so that they can change the bilirubin into product which can pass through their system. Yeah. So, if so the that's it, they have neonatal jaundice. Yeah. Not hemolysis and causing anemia and all that. So G6PD in the babies usually cause, uh, cause uh, neonatal jaundice. And in fact, the G6PD screening introduced in this country is because of the Neonatal jaundice caused by G6PD and causing them to have chronic thirst. So the incidence of chronic thirst at one time in Malaysia was very high. And people found out that it is because of G6PD deficiency. So because of that, to prevent chronic thirst, severe brain damage and all that, the government decided, okay, let's do G6PD screening so that we can detect a G6PD deficient patient earlier so that when they have jaundice and all that, we can treat them adequately and treat them aggressively. So that was the origin of the G6PD screening in this country to prevent severe neonatal jaundice, to prevent chronic thrush. Yeah? Not because to prevent fababine, fabism, and not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is the example of the cases which happened in Cameroon. Okay. 65 year old, Ayala, okay. not doing geriatrics, next. Okay, next. Okay, next is the hereditary spherocytosis. It is most common red blood cell membrane disorder. It's different from the G6PD. Uh, hereditary spherocytosis is membrane defect. Membrane defect. Okay, so incident it is autosomal dominant trait occur worldwide with an unknown rate of this incidence. Characterized by the increase in osmotic fragility and spherocytosis in peripheral blood. In the osmotic fragility where the graph is shifted to the right. I'll uh, show you okay, later. All right, here is the pathophysiology, which defect in protein complex in vertical interaction, leads to membrane instability, which affect spectrin and chirin complex, ventri and protein 4. So parts of the lipid barrier is not supported, loose RBC membrane, trapping in the microcirculation, extravascular hemolysis. And by the way, spherocytosis is extravascular hemolysis, not intravascular. Okay, here is the region where the ventri is in is defect with encarin and spectrin. So there will be uh, instability of the membrane integrity. Okay, next is the clinical features. 
the patient may have anemia, jaundice, and of course, splenomegaly because of the extravascular hemolysis. And yes, a reticular cytosis and risk of a plastic crisis where it occur when the patient being infected by the parvovirus, which later will, will happen. It will give a plastic, a plastic crisis for the patients. Okay. So they will have chronic anemia, right? Uh, yeah. Like G6PD, they have chronic anemia, but when they have infection, especially with uh, parvovirus and all that, suddenly the anemia will go down. Yeah, yes. from usually eight and all that, it may go down to five or six. So this is called aplastic crisis. Yes. Yeah, suddenly there is decreased production as well. Yes. So that's why it's called aplastic uh, crisis. So during aplastic crisis, there won't be any reticulocytosis because there is decreased production. Yeah, yeah. So there is increased breakdown and the decreased production as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, here is how it looks. It's different from the normal RBC, which is a sphere. And of course, there is no central pillar of RBC. Like normal RBC have some central pillar. And it is the graph of the osmotic fragility. It shifted to the right where the RBC of sphe the spherocyte will rupture easily, I mean, early compared to the normal RBC. Okay. It means uh, hereditary, sp hereditary spherocytosis is associated with uh, what was it? early destruction of the RBC. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next is uh, the C ovalocytosis, Southeast Asia ovalocytosis, common in Melanesia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, caused by ventri mutation. If heterozygous, it is mild, and homozygous, it is lethal. Cells are rigid and resist invasion by malaria parasite. And this is how it looks. It has uh, elliptus, ellipticus, and oval shape. Uh, so here. Did you guys see? Okay. It is oval in shape, yeah? Oh, oval shape. So yeah. that's why it's called epilocytosis. It's common among the orang asli. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. So that's all from me. Okay, any uh, questions? So uh, ovalocytosis is also called SEHO, S-E-A-H-O. Southeast Asian hereditary ovalocytosis. Oh. Okay, one uh, interesting problem is can can cause a renal problem called renal tubular acidosis. Yeah, but again, it is uh, very rare. There's no need for you to know about it, but you should know as a classification of anemia. So, classification of anemia, like you saw earlier, can be due to hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia can be due to membrane problem, can be due to hemoglobin problem, can be due to enzyme problem and can be due to the environmental problem, which means antibodies outside the cells. Okay? okay. So enzyme problem, Al-Hakim. Yes. Let's talk about a G6PD deficiency. There are many other enzymes problem, which are less common, pyruvate kinase uh, deficiency and so on. And membrane problem, spherocytosis is the commonest. Then it can have elliptocytosis or ovalocytosis. Not very common. Okay. You tell the existence, Dara. Yeah? And the diagnosis is very easy. You just look at the blood to the suspect, yes. and then uh, you do all those it, other, other genetic studies. Yeah? No, I mean, the treatment is mostly splenic, splenic tomy, right? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So, the splenic tomy. Yes. But not all patients require splenic tomy, only if they are severe. Yeah, transfusion dependent requires a lot of transfusion, yeah. or the spleen is very big, then you do splenectomy. When you do splenectomy, it almost cure the disease, right? Because it is extra medullary endoposis. Sorry, extra, extra vascular, vascular. Uh, hemolysis in the spleen. So when you remove the site of destruction, yes. then the lifespan of the red blood cells is longer, like normal. Questions? Are there? Abyss. Alhamdulillah, it's abyss. Okay, who's the next one?
Can you see my slide? Yes. Can you trouble set up in here? Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nenang Bisafrin and uh, I'm the last presenter for today. Uh, I will present um, immune thrombocytopenic program. So this is the contents that I will um, explain. First, I will give uh, a brief definition. Then uh, in the last part, I will, I will give a, a case example for immune thrombocytopenic program. For immune Okay, so according to the directive protocol for additions, uh, acute childhood ITP is the benign supplement mix order that presents with isolated thrombocytopenia of less than 100 in the absence of an underlying cause. And about 5% of patients with acute ITP may have recurrence of acute ITP. Uh, and then um, about 10% of patients with acute ITP will then develop persistent or chronic ITP. But, um, this is very rare because chronic ITP is, uh, is more uh, dominant in adult. ITP is, cal is classified into primary and secondary, uh, in which the primary is... Uh, what does ITP stand for? Uh, immune, immune, immune thrombocytin purpura. I told you. Okay. No, it, it stands for immune thrombocytopenia. Mm -hmm. it, used, it used to be used to, uh, you know, represent immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Mm -hmm. But not all patients with ITP come with purpura. Because mm -hmm. if you look at definition just now, platelet count less than 100,000. And if the platelet count is 90, is 80, 70, they will not come with purpura. They do not have purpura. Mm -hmm. So now ITP stands for immune thrombocytopenia. You can make the analysis at ITP if there is uh, thrombocytopenia, no other causes, and even though there's no purpura. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. So ITP is uh, classified into primary or secondary, where uh, the primary ITP is um, uh, is autoimmune disorder in which uh, only isolated thrombocytopenia is present with absence of underlying causes, whereas the secondary is uh, involved immune mediated disorder in which there is an underlying causes. So uh, the primary ITP can be classified further according to the phases of disease, which is newly diagnosed ITP, persistent ITP, chronic ITP, and severe ITP. Okay. So uh, for the newly diagnosed ITP, it is uh, ITP that is diagnosed within three months from the diagnosis. And for the persistent ITP, it is uh, ITP. Uh, where, where do you get this from? Uh, from pediatric. Protocols. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, for the persistent ITP, it is ITP that uh, occurs for about three to twelve months from the diagnosis. It also includes patient that does not wish spontaneous remission or uh, not maintaining complete response of the therapy. For the chronic ITP, it lasts for more than twelve months, and severe ITP present with bleeding symptoms at presentation stage require treatment or occurrence of new bleeding symptoms that require additional therapeutic intervention with a different platelet enhancing agents or an increased dose. Okay, the reason why I asked where to get this from is because uh, I don't quite agree with the classification. When you classify something, then it must not overlap. Yeah? But this is overlap. Patient with a newly diagnosed ITP can be severe. Patient with persistent ITP can be severe. Patient with chronic ITP can be severe as well. So as far as I know, okay, there are three classification only depending on the duration of the disease. Newly diagnosed, first three months. Okay, persistent is three months or so 12 months. And then chronic ITP. And each one of these can be severe ITP. So severe ITP is not one of the classification. It's a different, yeah? Because uh, chronic ITP can be mild, moderate, severe. Persistent can be mild, moderate, uh, severe. Okay. okay. Okay, so next, uh, secondary ITP that uh, occurs uh, as a result of an underlying causes. For example, alloimmune or neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia, in which uh, there is a rise increase of uh, maternal auto or alloantibodies to the uh, fetal, fetal antigens. 
Next is with called Aldo syndromes. Uh, usually it occurs uh, which is an axillary disorder. Okay, all these are uh, uh, viscal adhesion and uh, Ivan syndrome. All these are very rare. Primary emergency, also rare. But autoimmune is one of the causes of neonatal ITP. A patient may be born with very very low platelet and may even have intracranial bleed. And this is because of the uh, maternal Hello, just like at each iso immunization. Okay. Um, uh, so, okay, about the risk called algae syndrome, uh, it, uh, it is an axillary uh, disorder, so it commonly affects the male infants that will present with uh, micro thrombocytopenia, eczema, and persistent uh, infections. And uh, for the autoimmune disorder, it can, uh, for example, is infant syndrome. Um, and then uh, HIV is associated immune trauma. Uh, like I told you, all these are very rare. There's no need for you to go to okay. risk of LH, autoimmune, Ivan syndrome, and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen only three cases of Ivan syndrome in 30 years. Oh. Yeah. So, next uh, is the epidemiology of immune thrombocytopenia. Uh, it affects uh, about 5 in 100,000 of children in Malaysia. Uh, it's also said that to be the, the most commonest uh, cause of asymptomatic thrombocytopenia in children. It equally affects boys and girls. And then uh, the peak age is uh, 2 to 4 years old, but it generally can affect uh, from 2 to 10 years old. And about uh, 50 to 65 percent of cases of childhood ITP uh, present with recent, recent history of violent illness uh, as a result of its complication itself. Regarding the Pathogenesis, uh, it is believed that auto intbd mediated immunological destructions of the normal platelets in response to an unknown stimulus. The antibodies against the platelets, uh, the, the antibodies is against the platelet glycoproteic complexes. Uh, after binding of the antibody to the platelet surface, uh, the circulating antibody coated platelets are recognized by the RC receptor on the splenic macrophages, become ingested and destroyed. Therefore, uh, these, these will cause us to re reduce platelet count that may be followed by a compensatory increase of megaparocytes in the bone marrow. Uh, so, uh, in the B cell mechanisms, these splenic macrophages um, and dendritic cells will present uh, the platelet antigens to the T helper cell. And then the T helper cell will induce the cell to differentiate into plasma cell that will secrete auto antibodies. So this plasma cell will circulate around the peripheral blood and bone marrow that will causes uh, more antibodies to be produced. As a result, this causes uh, increased acceleration of platelet destruction uh, through... Uh, yeah, do you have a pointer? Do you want to show a pointer? Uh, Are you presenting on the handphone as well or what? Okay. So, can you point out? Oh, it's easier. Okay. And you talk. Can you talk too fast, uh, Nabila? Okay. Don't worry. We give you extra time. You want to go until six o'clock? Okay, no problem. Okay, slow down. So, let's slow down. Okay. So the auto antibodies will accelerate the uh, platelet destruction by the position of the complement of the platelets. Uh, through and then through uh, these alleles, uh, apoptosis, and also through impact from all policies. Uh, whereas in the T cell mechanisms, uh, the splenic macrophages and the dendritic cells will present the phagocytos platelet fragments to the T helper cells. Then the, uh, then the T helper cells will, uh, will initiate the cytotoxic T cell mechanisms. But uh, this mechanism usually is being regulated by the regulatory T cells. But uh, in uh, ITP patients, the, regula re the regulatory T cells uh, levels uh, is imbalanced, so it, it results in dysregulation of the immune response. Therefore, it will cause an uh, uh, increase in platelet destruction by impaired, impaired thromboporosis, uh, uh, by, and then also by apoptosis, the C elevations, and also uh, by platelet lysis. Okay, next, uh, the clinical manifestations are usually patients with reason with uh, a prompt or acute onset uh, of bleeding. The bleeding, uh, the severity of the bleeding can be from 
cutaneous bleeding, for example, trachea to mucosal buildings such as uh, gum buildings, epistaxis, or gross mitri to life threatening bleeding such as intracranial intra, intra hemorrhage. But uh, this is very, very rare. Also. And then uh, the duration of thrombocytopenia can be can occur from a few days to six months with average of two weeks. Also, the patient present with uh, viral infections in the preceding two to four weeks, for example, by uh, cytomegalovirus or various cellular virus. Okay, in the real life, usually uh, you never you don't get the history of viral infection, even though you mentioned just now 40 50 percent will have previous infection. But if you ask the mother whether it's any fever two weeks, three weeks before, okay, usually they do not remember because even mild infection can precipitate it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the other thing you said, even though uh, left threatening uh, bleed, intracranial hemorrhage is very, very, very rare, but that is an important aspect of uh, the manifestation. Okay, mm -hmm. that is the most dreaded manifestation because if you have continuous bleeding, you have particular so what? It's nice, isn't it? Have particular red spots and all that different from others. You can be proud of it and show people. You have bruises, so what? You have some bleeding from the nose, uh, so what? It's macho, isn't it? So it doesn't matter. And you don't lose uh, blood from uh, some bleeding, a couple of days bleeding from the nose and all that. But what is being, uh, we are worried about is the life threatening intracranial bleed. Right? And in the past, the treatment for ITP is to try to prevent this life threatening bleed. Yeah? Not to prevent petechial, not to prevent some small mouth uh, nose bleeding and all that, but to prevent intracranial bleed. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, this is the picture of Hatekia, uh, which is um, about the size of queen head uh, and is red in color, flat. And when we apply pressure on it, it does not blanch, meaning it does not turn white. And then this is a picture that's uh, to compare between Hatekia and Purpura. Purpura is uh, bigger in size, which is about uh, 0 0.3 to 1 centimeter. And, um, uh, it is uh, usually I uh, have a color of blue or purple discolorations, and it also does not blanch when we put pressure on it. This is picture of uh, gum bleeding. So, uh, the most pre complication of ITP is intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, the incidence in a child with ITP is uh, only between 0.1 to 0.5 percent, but um, it should be avoided. The risk is highest when the pellet count is less than 20 uh, or patient present with history of head trauma or aspirin use or presence of cerebral arterial, arterial venous malformations. Why, why aspirin use? Uh, it increases uh, the anti pellet. Yeah, okay, all right, the pellet puncture. Yeah, it's affected. Yeah, all right. And then uh, about 50% of all intra cranial hemorrhage occurs after one month of presentations, uh, about 30% occurs after six months. However, with, even with early treatment with steroid or intravenous immunoglobulin may not prevent the lead onset of intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, this is another diagnosis that are related to thrombocytomenia, for example, neonatal autoimmune, uh, HIV infections, drug-induced thrombocytopenia such as NSAID, especially uh, aspirin, hematological malignancy such as acute leukemia, congenital marrow failure syndromes, uh, for example, Fanconi anemia, autoimmune disorders such as SLE or even syndromes. Okay, it's so very easy to differentiate, isn't it? Yeah, because in patient, patient will have fever, coming with fever, can use history of drugs, hematological malignancies, we have hepatitis planomagy, because basically the diagnosis of ITP is a clinical diagnosis. Mm. Okay. Yeah? There is no diagnostic test. Bone marrow is not diagnostic test. It just excludes malignancies mm. yeah, as a cause of thrombocytopenia. So there is no diagnostic test. Okay? So ITP is diagnosed, clinical diagnosis. And the main feature is that patient comes with skin or mucous membrane bleeding but otherwise perfectly well, perfectly well. The keyword is perfectly well. 
patient does not have any fever, does not have any lymph nodes, does not have hepatitis splenomegaly, patient is active, running about and all that, but have a blood from the nose or have particle or bruises, spontaneous. So bleeding in the skin and mucous membrane in a perfectly well child. And on investigation, only the platelet is reduced. All the other blood parameters are normal. PBF is normal, hemoglobin is normal, white blood cell is normal. Then you can make the analysis of ITP. Okay. Yes. So next, uh, regarding the diagnosis and investigations, uh, ITP is actually meant, uh, ITP analysis is meant by diagnosis of exclusions. So you can make based on history, physical examination, blood counts, or peripheral blood films. Usually, a uh, patient will present uh, at the age of more than six months that is per this well until there is an acute onset of bleeding, can be cutaneous uh, and mucosal with no previous bleeding history or no family history of excessive bleeding, meaning it's not inherited. Uh, during physical examinations, there is an absence of hepatol splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy and the blood counts only show uh, isolated thrombocytopenia, means there's only uh, low levels of uh, platelets, but the hemoglobin and the, and the white blood cell counts are normal in acute IPP. In the plasma blood films, um, it's normal. So apart from that, uh, there's a reduce in uh, platelets counts, and also the platelets appear to be larger uh, due to megaphorocytes, uh, due to increase of um, Turnover. Where do you get this? Uh, Let's get this picture from. Uh, this is the platelets, larger platelets. Stella, where do you get it from? Where's your source? Uh, from from book nothing. From book. Because this is the first time I heard plasma blood film. Mm -hmm. Plasma is different, blood is different. So it is not plasma film. It is not plasma blood film, it is blood film. Mm -hmm. You get this word, plasma blood film? Is okay. that an exact copy? Plasma blood film? I think it is blood smear film. Yeah, blood smear or blood film. It's not plasma blood film. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Don't invent new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and then other tests that may be indicated uh, on when there is a typical presentation, such as antinuclear factor and DNA antibodies to exclude uh, autoimmune disorders, such as SLE, Coombs test uh, to, to exclude even syndromes, uh, cytomegalovirus serology for those less than one year old because it can be infected uh, during delivery or through intrauterine transmissions. Also, uh, Coagulation profile uh, when that when uh, non accidental injury is suspected, for example, abuse or uh, inherited uh, bleeding disorder such as hemophilia. Also, uh, in Coombs test, if only hemoglobin is low as well, then you want to do Coombs test, right? Because it is a combination of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP. Mm. Uh, next is HIV testing, uh, especially in indicated in high risk patient. Uh, for example, if uh, the parents are uh, HIV patients or the parents are drug users and immunoglobulin levels uh, to, talk for, to check for any signs of infections. Um, for, for bone marrow respiration, it is uh, actually it's not necessarily to, to, be, uh, to be carried out in, for, for the diagnosis because uh, if you are certain that the, uh, that the history uh, uh, and the family history and the physical simulations, uh, laboratory investigations are uh, of typical presentations of immune, immune thrombocytopenia, then uh, there's no indications to carry out bone marrow expressions. Um, so uh, what we can find is uh, only normal garnolocytic and erythrocytic series with uh, normal or increased number of megaparocytes. Uh, but it can be indicated uh, in cases, for example, before starting steroid therapy because, uh, because this therapy can mask the diagnosis of acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia. And then when there is absence of response to immunoglobulin therapy and or steroids, 
uh, and then when there is presence of anemia, neutropenia, hepatosplenia megaly or market lymphadenopathy to excrete acute leukemia or plastic anemia. Also, uh, if in adults, uh, we can... Adapt, I'll check out We have the epidemics. Okay, going back to that, uh, can you go back to uh, investigations? Investigation just now, you, uh, you mentioned the one before that. Yeah. Uh, after that, is uh, treatment indicators, yeah. So, uh, steroid therapy, uh, you're doing bone marrow before starting steroid therapy because you want to exclude leukemia, right? Like you said, you don't want to mask the leukemia because steroid is one of the treatment for leukemia as well. So when you give steroid now that you partially treat the leukemia. Mm. So you delay the diagnosis and uh, giving steroid alone in leukemia also can cause the patient to have poor prognosis for leukemia. So if you give steroid and this turn out to be leukemia, then you're converting a good prognosis leukemia to a poor prognosis leukemia. Right? So before starting steroid therapy, in the past, we used to do that routinely, but now we are more confident with our diagnosis, our clinical diagnosis, even before starting steroid therapy, you say, ah, I'm confident, ah, this is ITP, no need to do bone marrow. But if there is any doubt at all that this could be leukemia, you shouldn't start steroid until you have excluded leukemia by doing bone marrow aspiration. Absence of immunoglobulin to steroid, usually most of them will respond to immunoglobulin or steroid, either one, more than 80%. So if they do not respond, then you may have to think whether this could be other diagnosis or not, but it still could be ITP because not 100% will respond to immunoglobulin or steroid. And of course, like I said, if the uh, full blood count is not perfect, yeah, and there is other features, anemia, neutropenia, you may want to do bone marrow. Okay, and don't worry about that. Uh, number. Okay. Thanks. Uh, next, uh, regarding the management, um, most children actually remit spontaneously. Therefore, they might not need uh, treatment or hospitalizations. The <laughs> count is usually less than 20 at diagnosis. It can be severe, but uh, about 70% achieve a platelet count more than 50 by the end of the two week without treatment. So the Criteria that needs hospitaliz hospitalization is when there is severe left to train bleeding, for example, intracranial hemorrhage, regardless of the platelet counts, or when the or when the platelet count is less than 20, uh, with evidence of bleedings, or uh, when there is bleeding, but uh, they are insensible to healthcare, especially special um, steps is far away from the hospital or the clinics or when there's lack of confidence in home care. Okay, so his mobilization criteria, yeah, left attending, yes, you have to admit because you have to treat, yeah? You have to give IVIG, you have to give steroid. A platelet count less than 20 with evidence of bleeding. Not all have to be admitted depending on whether the bleeding is severe or not. If there is gum bleeding, if there is wet bleeding, you can see blood coming out from the gum, from the nose and all that, probably need to be admitted for observation as well as for treatment. Mm -hmm. Less than 20 without bleeding. Why you want to admit? Don't need to admit. Platelet of 15, platelet. Yeah? Inaccessible to healthcare because this is inaccessible to healthcare is a permanent condition. You cannot move the house to near the other hospital. And the low platelet less than 20,000 can be for one month, two months, three months. So you cannot admit the patient for three months because they're staying away from, far from the hospital. So this is not a reasonable uh, hospitalization criteria. Lack of confidence in home care so it's not reasonable because like I said, this can go on, can be chronic ITP, one year. So you want to admit the patient for one year because lack of confidence? Where do you get this from? Uh, protocol. Okay, so this is uh, some, this is not uh, really logical. So lack of confidence in home care in severe ITP, yes during episodes of severe ATP. Okay, next. Next, um, for the patient that needs observation of a traffic platelet count, but without specific treatments, is when the is when the platelet count is more than 20, but without readings, 
or when you small than 30 but with only cutaneous purpura and uh, also need to repeat full, full blood count within the first seven to two days to ensure that there's no evidence of involving marrow disorder. So the, the treatment is indicated when there is left Life threatening bleeding episodes such as intracranial hemorrhage, regardless of the blood counts, oh. or, or when the uh, count is less than 20 with mucosa bleeding, or when it is less than 10 with any bleeding. The choice of treatment is uh, it uses a uh, steroid such as oral prednisolone uh, for 2 mg uh, per kg per day. Don't worry about the dose. Yeah, so it's just short course of steroid. Yeah, you can either give oral steroid or you can give IV steroid, methyl prednisolone, mm. either oral or IV, and IV blocker. So this is called PET, platelet elevating therapy. So there are two types of therapy in ITP. Uh, there are three treatment. Number one is do nothing. Okay, just conservative treatment, and you have given some of the criteria. Not all hospitals follow the criteria. Even though if the real account is less than 20,000. In my practice, if the patient is not bleeding and all that, I will not give any steroid, I will not give any treatment. So the other one is platelet elevating therapy. This is called platelet elevating therapy. You give oral penicillin, you give immunoglobulin, the platelet will go up and this will be maintained for about uh, uh, three or four weeks and then it will go down again. So this is called platelet elevating therapy just to increase the platelet during that episode of bleeding. Yeah, the patient has got serious or severe bleeding from the nose, from the gum, non-stop for one day and all that, a lot of bleeding. A patient has got petechial all over, not just uh, a few spots of petechial, then you want to give. Or the platelet count is very low, less than 10,000, for example, okay? You want to be defensive, you want to practice defensive medicine, you don't want to be sued and all that. If anything happens, then you give platelet elevating therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, you give it up. And then it does not cause remission. That's called platelet elevating because it will come down again. It will follow its normal curve. If this disease, dia macam dah ada kada and kada. Dia dah tahu dah bila dia nak, bila dia nak uh, go into remission. Maybe three months remission, maybe four months. So if anything you give in between will increase the platelet for a while and then it'll go down again. And then come down again, you give another one, and then it'll go down again until it reaches it kada and kada is going to be healed at six months. Yeah, so they may go into spontaneous remission. Whatever you give will just increase the bleeding count for a while. And you give this just for support. If severe bleeding, platelet is very low. This platelet elevating therapy. The other one is uh, remission induction therapy. Yeah, you want to make the patient be cured of the disease. You want to induce remission. And usually this is used in chronic ITP, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. Nabila. Yes. yes, go on. Uh, next for the initial treatment, in cases of when there is severe bleeding, for example, um, when the uh, hemoglobin levels become low, uh, like in gastrointestinal bleeding, when it is severe, so we give a high dose of intravenous methyl prednisolone uh, and then intravenous immunoglobulin intravenous immunoglobulins. Next is a combination of intravenous immunoglobulin and methyl prednisolone in left uterine conditions, like the transfusion in left threatening hemorrhage. And also if all these model details, then we can carry out splenectomy and uh, neurosurgical intervention in case of intracranial hemorrhage. So uh, all this is, all this is plenipotent therapy, all right? And, uh, only if there is intracranial bleed, then you want to give everything. You give penicillin plus IVIG, and you give platelet transfusion as well. If it is life threatening, it is intracranial bleed. Otherwise, you don't give platelet transfusion because it is no use, isn't it? Nabila? Because the platelet will be destroyed by the antibodies. Yeah? So, what's the platelet lifespan? Uh, okay. What's the platelet lifespan? Uh, 90 days. 90 days. No, I think that's right. That's, uh, it's only about one week. Uh, one week. Yeah, oh. in normal people. With ITP and all that, it lasts only a few hours. Oh. Yeah, so that's why you don't give platelet transmission. If you want to give platelet transmission, you have to give platelet transmission every three or four hours to maintain. Oh. 
because once you give, you'll be destroyed. Once you give, you'll be destroyed. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you will have to give much more than usual. Usually, if you give one unit of playlet per meter square surface area, that will increase the playlet by about 50,000. So in patient with ITP, you want to increase by 50,000, you may have to give four units per meter square, six units per meter square of the surface area. Yeah, you have to give much more because these are being destroyed. So you have to give more frequent and you have to give much more. So you are wasting platelet. Yeah, your blood bank will go bankrupt of platelet. So that's why you give it only if there's intracranial bleed, left thing bleed, airway bleeding, for example, patient is dying, you give all that. The onset of action of IVIG and metaprednisolone usually 14 hours. Yeah, the platelet will come up significantly mm -hmm. after about 14 hours. All right, okay. Um, next is chronic ITP. This is okay. uh, I'm this uh, slide, chronic ITP 20. Uh, about, uh, total is about 32. 32, chronic ITP, 32 slides. Right. I don't know. Uh, it is only a few slides. Okay, yes. Okay, so uh, chronic TP is the one that usually occurs in adults. Uh, so uh, it's very rare to observe in children, but it can also occur. And uh, yeah, this, so point this is a wrong definition, isn't it? Because it's a chronic ITP just now, early definition is more than one year. Persistent ITP is three months to one year. Nearly diagnosed is the first three months. Why keep changing the criteria? Also, in so I'm not sure whether you look, you look, you go back. Do you remember your, your classification chronic ITP if it is persists more than one year? Mm -hmm. The old criteria is more than six months is chronic and less than six months is acute. So in the old criteria, that classification, there is no such thing as newly diagnosed, there is no such thing as persistent. So mm -hmm. just divide to acute and chronic and the division is six months. So this old definition. Don't use anymore. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, for example, you said about 20% uh, of patients uh, of acute ITP patients, uh, it has a wide spectrum of many manifestations from mild asymptomatic low pellet counts to intermittent relapsing, symptomatic thrombocytopenia, or to the rare, stubborn, and persistent symptomatic and hemorrhagic disease. Uh, so, management is uh, given by counseling and education of parents and caregiver, where uh, they must understand the, uh, they must understand the history of the, uh, of the chronic ITP, and then, uh, uh, and then they're also able to detect problems and complications that may be arise from the, uh, from the disease itself. Uh, this is to avoid any unwanted um, incidents. And then uh, parents and critical also must be comfortable enough to take care of patients that is persistently have low pellet counts. So uh, uh, the patients actually must uh, avoid um, physical activities such as sports, which can cause uh, bleeding and injuries. At the same time, uh, the parent and critical must also uh, be aware of when and how to seek the early medical attention when the problem arises. So uh, in the asymptomatic patients, uh, uh, the management is done by monitoring and precaution during this activity uh, by means uh, to avoid uh, bleeding or injury. And in the symptomatic patients, uh, it's done by short course of treatments, uh, like the one in the acute ITP. And then also, uh, we need to revisit diagnosis in order to exclude other causes of thrombocytopenia. For second line therapies, uh, it uses steroid pulses, uh, which means the oral dexamethasone is given on four consecutive days for every four weeks for four months. Also, uh, intermittent anti RH or anti D inevitably for those with uh, RH for those with RHD positive only. Uh, this option actually is very, very, very uh, effective in order to uh, increase the platelet counts, but it can cause uh, a male anemia. Because which, which, uh, which one? Uh, the, the NTP immunoglobulin. It is just like IVIG. Yeah? So IVIG and NTD, the action is the same. 
Yeah, usually you want to give IVIG rather than uh, NTRHD. NTRHD is uh, rarely used. So basically, this is short course platelet elevating therapy. Yeah, dexamethasone, just like the first line. There's no need for you to give the uh, second line. You can still continue with the steroid prednisolone okay. unless there is no response. Yeah, you keep prednisolone uh, for four days every four weeks, and uh, this is platelet elevating therapy because after four weeks the effect will come down. So you want to give some more. And this is not done nowadays, right? Because there is no need for you to give platelet elevating therapy, right? In a patient. It will not, it will just increase for a while and then it will come down. So there is uh, no value of uh, giving that. So this is hardly used nowadays, yeah? The pulse. Uh, okay. Um, next, uh, for splenectomy, it is rarely indicated in children because uh, the risk of dying from TP is uh, only 0.02%, whilst uh, the mortality that associated with post splenectomy is higher, uh, which is 1.4 to 2.7%. However, it may be considered if there is left threatening bleeding event or when there is severe lifestyle restriction with no or transient success with intermittent intravenous immunoglobulin, a past steroids or NTD immunoglobulins. So before the spin, spin before the spin actually. Okay, that is, uh, I don't need to talk about uh, before spin, because it's really done, right? Really indicated. Okay. okay. Um, so. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a table to compare between uh, acute ITP and, and chronic ITP. So in acute ITP, uh, it occurs in childhood, uh, from two to four years, and it, in, and in chronic ATP, it occurs in adults. In acute ATP, there's no sex preference, uh, meaning um, uh, the ratio of um, male patient that has ITP is same as the female. Whereas in chronic ATP, the female is it, uh, the female is more than the male. Um, in acute ATP, a uh, patient uh, is also usually observed to have uh, preceding viral infections, whereas uh, in chronic ITP, there's no history of viral infections. Uh, the bleeding in ITP is sudden onset and uh, is insidious onset in the chronic ITP. So uh, both have uh, the sense of bleeding can, can occur superficial. And, and then whereas in chronic ITP, uh, for example, in women, uh, the women can have menorrhagia. Uh, meaning that it has prolonged uh, building in Korea. So, uh, yeah, yeah, because I doubt, isn't it? Uh, 15 to 14, childhood, two to four years, where, where can I have menorrhagia? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, chronic ITP. Yeah. Uh, in chronic ITP. Yeah, but because of the age, you look at the top there, childhood, acute ITP is usually children, chronic ITP is an adult, and in children, you will not have menorrhagia. Mm. Yeah. Adults, yeah, it can have menorrhagia. It's understood. This is part of uh, mucous membrane bleeding. Menorrhagia is part of mucous membrane bleeding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the degree of thrombocytopenia is severe in EKTP, but moderate in chronic uh, TP. The spleen can be can be palpable or just palpable in EKTP, but uh, it's not palpable in chronic TP. Uh, uh, there's uh, spontaneous remissions in EKTP, but uh, in chronic ATP, they might need therapy. Uh, the recurrence of EKTP is uncommon, but it is common to occur in chronic ATP. And the durations uh, of thrombocytopenia in EKTP can be from um, one to six months, but uh, in chronic ATP, uh, because it's chronic, then it can occur from months to year. And, uh, from months to years, not to year. Not mm -hmm. to one year, it can go on for two years, three years, four years, and all. Yeah? From months to years. Yes. Um, the prognosis is very good in your PTP, uh, but, it's, but, in, but in chronic TP, the prognosis is uh, fair. Uh, so, regarding the prognosis in children, uh, it's very good, uh, meaning that, uh, for example, more than 80% of children with untreated immune thrombocytopenia have a spontaneous recovery with completely normal platelet counts in two to eight weeks. 
uh, factor pleading only occurs in 0.9% of all initial presentations. Uh, in adults, approximately. Nanti tak baca. We are all children here. Nanti tak baca. So this is just a brief case examples. Um, Sian. This, this is your last slide. Ah uh, yes. Um, okay. Sian as age five years old, developed bruising and scratch over twenty two hours. So meaning that he has uh, an acute onset. She had an upper respiratory tract infection during the previous weeks. On examination, she appeared well, but had a perforated skin rash with some bruises on her trunk and legs. There were three blood blisters on her tongues and buccal mucosa, but no final hemorrhages. Lipodinopathy or hepatospina medini. Urine was normal on the stick, on the stick testing, meaning there's no hematuria and uh, a, full, a full blood count show hemoglobin of 11.5 with normal indices, white blood cells and diffusion normal and platelet count is um, 70, meaning it's low. The platelets on the blood, on the blood film were large, the film was otherwise normal. A diagnosis, of, a diagnosis of ITP was made and she was discharged home. Her parents were counseled and given emergency contact names and telephone numbers. They were also given literature on patients and advice that she should avoid contact sports but should continue to attend school. But for the next two weeks, she could she continue to avoid bruising and, and purpura but um, there's no other symptoms. By the third week, she had no new bruises and her blood count was 25 um, increase from, from the previous result. And the blood count and film showed no new abnormalities. In the following week, the blood count was 74 also increased from the previous and will at the equals 200. She was died, discharged from follow-ups. So um, in conclusion to the case, we can conclude that um, a QATP actually does not need um, a treatment because it can occur, uh, the remission can occur spontaneously. That can be also be in this case. Okay, so um, it doesn't require any treatment because most of them will have spontaneous remission. And whatever you do and all that, you just increase the playlist for a while only and it will come down again. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It will go on like that, up and down and down. So the treatment itself can cause uh, side effects. Mm -hmm. So this is typical presentation, typical age that is uh, preceding uh, respiratory infection and present with uh, superficial bleeding, skin rash, and some uh, blisters in the uh, mucous membrane. Plate count is... Uh, very, very low, okay? Usually, the presentation, they are less than 30,000, and all the others are normal. Playlet is large on blood film, this guy, young playlet, okay? There is increase in uh, playlet production. So, all the young playlet goes out, and so that's why they are very large. But, but having said that, now it has been found that sometimes thrombopoiesis is not, uh, is depressed as well, yeah? Just like in thalassemia, the erythropoiesis is depressed, ineffective erythropoiesis. So in ITP, the platelet production can be depressed as well. So one of the treatment now for uh, ITP is uh, thrombopoietin. Okay, injection of thrombopoietin to increase the production of uh, platelet. The other thing uh, for the treatment of chronic ITP, which I've not mentioned, is the use of monoclonal antibodies, rituximab. This is against CD20 and CD20 is uh, the markers on B cell. So when you attack the B cell, if you look at the pathogenesis, okay, one of the pathogenesis is the antibodies produced by the B cell. So when you give this reductant monoclonal antibodies against the B cell, that's one of the induction remission therapy for patient with chronic ITP. It's not used for acute ITP, it's used for chronic ITP to induce remission. So usually in acute ITP, you don't give induction, uh, uh, remission induction therapy because you expect them to recover by itself. But chronic ITP, the chances of recovering by itself is much lower. So you want to try and induce remission. So induction remission therapy in chronic ITP, number one is by giving thrombopoietin. Number two is by giving uh, uh, splenectomy. Number three is uh, by giving rituximab. The first choice will be rituximab first. If rituximab doesn't work, then you do splenectomy. 
number 14, the effectiveness is much less compared to hysterectomy and, uh, and rituximab. Okay, this patient is lucky because the patient, the platelet count comes up, come back to normal very quickly. Third week, and then the following week, by fourth week, that's increased uh, to normal already. Right? Okay. So, okay. Uh, some of my references. Um, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Any comment? Other? If I go, already, we better stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Anybody have any question? Can uh, WhatsApp me or email me any questions. Uh, anybody want to argue with me or so and tell me what I said is wrong and all that, can WhatsApp me or email me. Okay, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank, you, Prof. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Okay, bye-bye.